Knowledge is information. But not all information turns into knowledge. Today, every company leaves digital footprints in hundreds of different sources. But this information by itself does not tell you who it is you're looking at and what the risks of doing business with them are. Businesses can't exist in a vacuum. They need employees, customers, partners, contractors, investors. Good counter-agents help a company succeed, create products, make profit, expand business opportunities. But what about bad ones? 49% of organizations around the world say that they've been victims of fraud or economic crime. Two-thirds of Russian companies say they've encountered economic crime in the past two years. This is significantly higher than the global average. Every year, 15% of companies simply disappear, whether on their own initiative or because they're forced to do so by tax bodies often leaving unpaid debts. If you want to minimize your risk, you need to find and analyze every scrap of information you can. Identifying, analyzing, collecting facts. Processing big data is impossible without qualified specialists, experience, time, expensive equipment, new technology, machine learning, graphs. Spark Interfax gathers information from all available sources and converts it into knowledge, allowing you to see the world of business in its entirety with all its risks and opportunities. And there's no doubt that tomorrow we'll be able to understand the world of business even better thanks to the emerging digital economy, cutting-edge technology and the availability of new information about the lives of companies. Knowledge decreases risks and creates trust. The foundation of any successful business. Knowledge is information, but not all information turns into knowledge. Today, every company leaves digital footprints in hundreds of different sources. But this information by itself does not tell you who it is you're looking at and what the risks of doing business with them are. Businesses can't exist in a vacuum. They need employees, customers, partners, contractors, investors. Good counter-agents help a company succeed, create products, make profit, expand business opportunities. But what about bad ones? 49% of organizations around the world say that they've been victims of fraud or economic crime. Two-thirds of Russian companies say they've encountered economic crime in the past two years. This is significantly higher than the global average. Every year, 15% of companies simply disappear, whether on their own initiative 
or because they're forced to do so by tax bodies often leaving unpaid debts. If you want to minimize your risk, you need to find and analyze every scrap of information you can. Identifying, analyzing, collecting facts. Processing big data is impossible without qualified specialists, experience, time, expensive equipment, new technology, machine learning, graphs. Spark Interfax gathers information from all available sources and converts it into knowledge, allowing you to see the world of business in its entirety with all its risks and opportunities. And there's no doubt that tomorrow we'll be able to understand the world of business even better thanks to the emerging digital economy, cutting-edge technology and the availability of new information about the lives of companies. Knowledge decreases risks and creates trust. The foundation of any successful business. Knowledge is information, but not all information turns into knowledge. Today every company leaves digital footprints in hundreds of different sources. But this information by itself does not tell you who it is you're looking at and what the risks of doing business with them are. Businesses can't exist in a vacuum. They need employees, customers, partners, contractors, investors. Good counter-agents help a company succeed, create products, make profit, expand business opportunities. But what about bad ones? 49% of organizations around the world say that they've been victims of fraud or economic crime. Two-thirds of Russian companies say they've encountered economic crime in the past two years. This is significantly higher than the global average. Every year, 15% of companies simply disappear, whether on their own initiative or because they're forced to do so by tax bodies often leaving unpaid debts. If you want to minimize your risk, you need to find and analyze every scrap of information you can, identifying, analyzing, collecting facts. Processing big data is impossible without qualified specialists, experience, time, expensive equipment, new technology, machine learning, graphs. Spark Interfax gathers information from all available sources and converts it into knowledge, allowing you to see the world of business in its entirety with all its risks and opportunities. And there's no doubt that tomorrow we'll be able to understand the world of business even better thanks to the emerging digital economy, cutting-edge technology, and the availability of new information about the lives of companies. Knowledge decreases risks and creates trust. 
the foundation of any successful business. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining RENCAP's 12th Africa Conference. This one is focused mainly on sub-Saharan Africa. We've got 50 corporates, we've got over 100 investors, at least 250 meetings already set up. Um, I hope you enjoy the next few days. Um, and that you had a decent break at some point in August, um, because we're all going to have a fairly interesting few months ahead, I think, through to through to the end of the year. Um, right, what I'm going to do here is, is talk pretty fast because my kids have been telling me that when it comes to watching stuff online uh, that they've been speeding up all their teachers and professors by at least 50 percent or 100 percent I, I don't want to put the effort on you to, to do that so um, I'm going to speak fairly fast and also because I've spoken to a fair number of these slides already um, firstly what's happening for sub-Sahara on growth We've got a, a situation where obviously it's not quite as strong um, as the rest of the world in 2021, but that's because 2020 was a year of outperformance by Sub-Sahara, just as it had been uh, in 2009. Um, 2009, because it was a global financial crash and Africa was less financialized, if you like. Um, and this time, uh, because the continent is younger um, and it just didn't suffer quite as much from the lockdowns where they where they happened um, in most cases the youth story we've talked about before we talked about it from february march i think last year 2020 um, it continues to be a, a big reason why um, the covid hasn't hit as badly um, at least in terms of the health outcomes um, there's a whole host of uh, diseases which are still killing far far more people than covid is uh, in africa um, and, and we're seeing, you know, if I compare Nigeria to Brazil, interestingly, they're almost identical populations right now. Um, Brazil is older. Um, it, it got its fertility rate lower back in the 1980s. Um, and, and Brazil's been getting, what, 80 to 100,000 new cases a day. Uh, Nigeria's only once, I think, popped over 2,000 a day. Um, so a very different uh, outcome. Obviously, there's, there's less testing. What, our Lagos office is telling us is that people are getting tested when they travel in Nigeria. They're getting tested when they're seriously ill, but but otherwise not as much, perhaps. But nonetheless, this has meant that Nigeria's had an easier crisis, at least in GDP terms. Big picture story, and the big shift I still I still think is that that U.S., Europe, Japan, their debt levels have jumped higher yet again, um, and that high debt is going to keep interest rates in developed markets extremely low for a very long time to come. Uh, if we go back to February, March this year, yes, I was worrying that my call of zero to 2% US treasuries uh, through to 2030, that call wasn't going to even last 2021. Um, but the way US treasury yields have come back down in recent months continues to support that view. German bunds in red on this chart, continuing to track Japan with about a 17, 18 year lag. US a bit higher, um, but not able to break away too far from those German or Japanese bond yields. Um, and the consequence of that, of course, being that investors continue to look for yield. Uh, and they're looking for yield in dollar debt first, and that's something we've seen in the flows over the last 12 months. Um, and, and the yield then on emerging market dollar debt has been coming down to what, about 4%. We're at 3.8% last week. Um, so my base case is that that's gonna continue to lower gently through the decade. And as a result, sub-Saharan borrowers, so more frontier borrowers, are also gonna be able to borrow at ever cheaper rates. Um, there are gonna be exceptions. I'm flagging here the chart that I might have been showing you actually first time back in November, it's been updated since then. Um, there are countries where the interest payments as a percentage of government revenues are extremely high. I mean, over 60% in Sri Lanka's case. Um, and, and where interest payments as a percentage of GDP are also extremely high. Um, in, in again, in Sri Lanka's case, over 6% of GDP. And Sri Lanka's eurobonds are priced for default. Um, other countries which also look vulnerable, Egypt, uh, Pakistan, Angola, um, do actually have IMF programs in place. 
And I think that's one of the key reasons why why we're still recommending those bonds, but but also why we haven't seen them priced to default. Um, Lebanon's obviously run into trouble. Zambia, we'll get to a little bit later. Um, my concern in the longer run is that countries that go out and borrow need to be borrowing in order to boost their export capacity. Um, and what's happened over the last 10 years, I'm using 2019 data because 2020 is so distorted by the, by the GDP hit. Uh, between 2010 and 2019, you can see most countries uh, in, in Africa saw a big increase in their debt to exports ratio, telling you that the borrowing didn't translate into higher export capacity, which will help them manage the debt. Now, thanks to globally falling interest rates over the last 10 years, that hasn't really uh, mattered too much, uh, except for a few countries. Um, but it's going to matter um, over the next five to 10 years, unless the borrowing is used to boost that export capacity. And, and if we look at Asia, that's exactly what's happened in Asia. In the main, uh, these, these ratios um, have not deteriorated dr dramatically uh, in Asia. And you've got a country like Vietnam uh, looking particularly good there on the right-hand side. Yes, there's been an increase in external borrowing, but export capacity has gone up way in excess of that. And as a result, their debt to exports ratios got better. And that's why Vietnam is one of the most favoured frontier markets. And the country's in trouble on the left in, the, in Asia too, Lebanon in default, Sri Lanka threatened by default, uh, Pakistan you know, has to watch what it's doing carefully in the next few, few months. Um, now, my default worries, which obviously got greater in February, March, when Chad and Ethiopia and Zambia all looked to the G20 and said, we need a debt uh, forgiveness. And the idea of this G20 debt forgiveness framework was that, that China would be involved, um, particularly important for a country like Zambia. Um, our concern was we were going to see a whole host of countries going down this route. Um, who was next uh, was, the, was the, the concern and Laos looked like one, Sri Lanka looked like another and so on. Um, now the SDR increase, the special drawing rights increase that came through in August, I think is taking the pressure off for at least six to 12 months, um, even maybe in Sri Lanka's case, um, but possibly for, for even two to three years. Um, the emerging markets seeing big increases in their uh, reserves as a result of this special drawings rights increase. Um, China, obviously a massive $41 billion, South Africa, uh, an extra $4 billion. Um, and in Africa, we've had a very helpful boost uh, to, to a great many countries. Um, that's frontier. And if I show you Africa here, um, we've got North Africa on the right hand side. So all of, in all of these countries, reserves that will have be showing up as a slightly better figures for the end of August. And what we're going to hear in the next session from the head of the IMF Africa department is the extent to which rich countries are going to take their allocation of special drawing rights, which I think in the US cases is, is well over $100 billion on its own and reallocate them too. Um, and that does look like it's on the cards, um, although I, I think we'll struggle to, to pin down a date as to when these extra uh, tens, maybe hundreds of billions could be coming to lower income countries. Certainly this is really helpful for now. So for now, the concerns about debt default, except where we're well down the road as we are in Zambia, um, I, I think are, are gonna be considerably lessened. Big picture, um, this is the GDP map I'll, I'll have shown you a, a few times already. Um, and also the, the look at how countries look in terms of democracies or autocracies based on polity fours uh, figures from a, a year or so ago. So there's been a couple of changes since. Um, and in fact, on that front, you know, this, this last few days, we've just had a coup uh, announced in Guinea uh, on the left hand side of the map there in, in grey. And in grey, because this is where adult literacy is sub 40%. Even today, just under two fifths of, of adults can actually read or write in any language in Guinea. Uh, and also in Niger, uh, Mali, Chad, South Sudan, Somalia, which happened to be 
a lot of the countries in trouble. In fact, we've had coups in uh, Chad and Mali, as well as Guinea, just in the last few months. Um, and I think that is going to continue to be a problem for the Sahel region. Um, Afghanistan, where we've had the military takeover just recently, uh, the figures there for, for literacy are about 42%. Not a huge surprise that we should be seeing ongoing conflicts and, and a great deal of instability. But the core point that I'm usually drawing out from this, this map is the green countries are where adult literacy is 70 to 80% or more, and that's enough to industrialize. That's a great story for North Africa, a great story for Southern Africa, if we get a couple of other things right too. Um, but admittedly, this is going to be an ongoing problem for, for a, most of West Africa, with a notable exception of Ghana and Southern Nigeria. And then electricity is the next big uh, issue. Again, I've been talking to you about this before. Uh, we did a big report in 2018. Uh, th these data are, are a few years old now. Uh, they don't get updated very often, unfortunately. Again, Ghana comes out pretty well here. Um, North Africa comes out well. Southern Africa could be doing well too. Um, and there's the underlying issue that I've talked to you about of fertility rates. And the argument that we're putting across is that it's low fertility countries that have high domestic savings. Those high domestic savings keep interest rates low. And those low interest rates means you've got plenty of money for infrastructure spending, plenty of money for electricity, for example, which is why Morocco, Tunisia are all good on this front. South Africa, although South Africans would disagree with me, are looking pretty good on the electricity front compared to other, to many other countries in Sub-Sahara. Um, what interests me here are the countries where we'll see a shift in the next five to 15 years. That's uh, Egypt, Ethiopia, interestingly, Kenya, uh, Ghana, they're the ones where we should see fertility rates dropping below three children per woman and it tends to be when savings jump. So the bank lending story in Mauritius or Morocco or Tunisia, Egypt, South Africa, Egypt less so because they're not there yet, but the other countries already high because of this fertility rate story and where fertility is too high, Angola, DRC, uh, Nigeria, that's telling us that bank lending is going to continue to be small as a, as a percentage of GDP. Also means the return on capital, of course, is extremely high because capital is so scarce in these countries, unless they're running a current account surplus. Capital is so scarce that it's very valuable. So it's possible to make very good returns, but it's not going to be a uh, countries where you're likely to see very high infrastructure um, spend, at least not without massively high commodity prices too. And then, and then the other issue about fertility that I, I just need to reiterate, but speed me up to 50 to 100% if you've heard this before, um, is that countries where you've got roughly equal numbers of adults to kids, like a one for one ratio on the left hand side, your per capita growth is 1.4% on average. That's looking at all countries in the world since 1960. So an awful lot of data points. Um, it's when you cut the number of kids uh, down dramatically uh, relative to adults, when you've got like two adults, two to two and a half adults per child in your country, child or pensioner, but usually it'll be uh, kids when we're talking about developing countries. That's when your per capita GDP growth takes off. That's when you start booming three, four, five percent per capita GDP growth. And you add in the population growth on top and you start getting in these six, seven, eight percent numbers, which are so fantastic. Africa's trouble problem has been that the, the fertility rates have been too high, which is why from 1960 on the left of this table, which you can't possibly read. I'm sorry, it's far too small, but you can read it in the presentation later. Um, the, the growth rates haven't been good enough to, to, to lift most of the continent um, out of low income status. But it's changing. And, and based on UN forecasts now, which I do hope will be wrong, but based on what they're saying now, assuming fairly high fertility rates for, for years, at least another 10 years in, in many countries, um, you're going to see everybody looking much better by 2050, nearly everybody, but, but many countries already by 2030. 
So that's the big picture stuff that, that we've talked about. Where are we at on markets right now? Um, let's just focus on currencies. You know, I'm obsessed by them, um, particularly because if you're running a current account surplus, then all our worries about utility rates, low deposits equals high interest rates. That gets invalidated if a country has a current account surplus. So, so that, that little box on the top right of that chart is telling you that if you're running a current account surplus, even if you've got a small banking system, you can have basically flat 0% real rates, minus 0.2 in fact, real rates, um, if you're running a current account surplus. So, so having a cheap currency is really quite helpful. Throw in euro dollar, not because I've got any sense of, of what it's going to do. I, I never know that. Um, what all I can say is that if we look at where the range has been trending for the last six months or so, somewhere between 117 and 124 would be my guess for the next 12 months with a slight, slight bias to dollar weakness. Um, but I, I wouldn't hang many forecasts on that. Um, what's more interesting is, or more useful, is, is our real effective exchange rate estimates. Um, and the difficulty for, for Africa here would be the countries on the, the top half of this table, which are looking overvalued currencies over uh, compared to their last 25 years, uh, including Republic of Congo, Nigeria, Egypt, Kenya, uh, Ethiopia, Zambia, and so on. And that, that is a, a problem, um, given, given our point that you need to be running a current account surplus to have low interest rates. If you're running an overvalued currency, it's going to make it harder to run that current account surplus. Zambia, of course, still can because the copper prices are so insanely high. Um, but it, it should be. Countries lower down on this should be in a better place. But countries like Ghana, um, South Africa, actually, um, Angola, Rwanda, all looking pretty cheap. Um, and, and, and I think quite interesting times to be getting involved. And then, and then there's countries like Tunisia which have been looking very cheap on this model for years now. But the underlying reality fully justifies it being this cheap. Um, Tunisia shouldn't be running a current account deficit with the IMF is saying, what, minus 9.5% of GDP in 2021. Shouldn't be running such a big deficit if, if there wasn't quite a lot wrong with the, uh, the economy. Um, how often are currencies here? So the one which is looking exceptionally good value right now, this is as of Monday morning, 6th of September, actually data, 20%, more than 20% cheap is, is Ghana. But to be fair, it has been more than 20% cheap, 20% of the time. Um, so it doesn't tell us we're going to get an instant bounce back. Um, and, and that's true for quite a few of the countries, actually, which are looking at 5 to 20% undervalued too. A lot of them have been this cheap for, for quite some time over the last 25 years. So there's no strongly compelling message here about which currencies are going to change dramatically in the near term. For Nigeria, this is a market which is which has actually been down a little bit in 2021 uh, in dollar terms. Um, the currency remains the, the stumbling block. Um, We've got at least two estimates of fair value. Yvonne is likely to be talking about them um, at, at another session through the course of this week. Um, if I had to guess where I think the currency ought to be, I would say a little bit weaker than 504 to the dollar would be appropriate. Um, so we are looking overvalued. I wouldn't mind if, if that overvaluation was justified by a hefty current account surplus, like it is in Zambia's case, but it's not. So sooner or later, we'll have to see some, some adjustment on that. And, and the difficulty that portfolio investors have um, in terms of accessing the local market, getting money in and out, continues to be a problem for, for this market to perform. Tunisia, this is a country that I really hoped was going to come good in the 2020s. Um, we wrote a piece back in 2018. It says all about the elections in 2019, 2020. If we see reformists coming to power, you could, you could take this country in a brand new direction. It didn't happen. And the president who did win, who's no economist, has now closed down parliament, 
initially for 30 days as per the constitution. He's now indefinitely extended that. I haven't seen the constitutional provision that allows him to do that. Um, we've got democracy perhaps on the way out as it stands. Uh, awkward relations with the IMF. There was an attempt to try and rebuild them a few months ago. That The government was doing that. They've just been sacked. Eurobond prices are telling you that the markets are not uh, very enthusiastic about where Tunisia is going. Um, so it's, it's a small market um, and it's not uh, doing itself any favours right now. Could that change? I mean, hopefully we get a strong government backed by a president who's prepared to take an awful lot of power under his wing. Maybe they, maybe this, this will start to come good in a few months time, but, but as of now, there's no, no strong reason to believe that. Morocco. Actually, Morocco is, is not only got elections this week, um, it's seeing a, a fantastic turn at last in, in the virus numbers after a heck of a rise over the last few months with the Delta variant last couple of months. Um, so tourism could be coming back. Car output remains a big issue. And globally, we're seeing, we're seeing impediments and blockages and shutdowns. Um, I haven't seen anything that on that in Morocco. In fact, almost the opposite. We're seeing more factories coming to Morocco to support the supply chain. This, the industrialization story that we've been talking about from Morocco for, for years now is well in play. Um, and this could be a very interesting recovery story. Um, the shock of the last month or two to me has been Zambia, where um, an incumbent losing election, in fact, of course, has happened in Zambia. Um, but this, this was really helpful. And you, you see it in a jump in the Eurobond price just in the last month or so. And people are uh, looking much more optimistically now about what the new businessman president can do. Uh, he wants an IMF deal. Um, copper prices are ballistically high. We're kind of at levels we saw in the 1970s as well as during the boom time of, of kind of the 2000s. Um, and, and they've got great human capital. They've got loads of electricity. Um, they even have a high investment to GDP ratio. There's an awful lot right about this country which good leadership could, could turn into something good. We've also seen change in Tanzania, where, where Michael Fuli was, yeah, a mix of, uh, is one way of putting it, of, of ideas, um, the bulldozer, as he was known. But his, his demise to COVID has, has left us with a new, the vice president's been promoted into that job. She looks really interesting. She studied uh, development economics uh, at least for a year um, at a UK university. She she's, seems to be a steady pair of hands. She seems to be being more transparent about COVID. I am genuinely very interested by where she can take this country. And in Congo, um, you might have looked at the, uh, the towers business there over the last year or two. Um, the president has been taking some of the power back, uh, the, the official power he's been drawing into himself, which he should have had all along, but which a lot of the unofficial power, of course, was still with the old president. So there's been some shifts happening there too. So positive political change in quite a few of the major major stories here in, in Central and, and Southern Africa. Um, what else am I looking at? Occasionally a question comes up, what's happening in Zimbabwe? It's still a mess. Uh, well, still a mix of certainly a political mess, efforts to try and control the currency, struggling. Um, much better story in Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire. You've had re-elected presidents who've already given us strong investment-led growth stories. How's that possible with their high fertility rates? It's possible, I think, thanks to the currency peg, which at least keep interest rates low, which is supportive of the investment story. And Senegal's got this whole oil story, which got delayed last year, but I think it's, from what I hear, is, is back on track and we're going to see high investment and very, very high growth out of Senegal over the next uh, two to three years. Um, Rwanda's really interested me in the headlines for the last month or so. You've got this sending troops off to northern Mozambique, uh, where you've got these kind of Muslim extremists who've been bringing the gas story to a halt. Um, Rwanda sending the troops down to try and sort that problem out. And also saying to an Afghan girls boarding school, come to Rwanda for a term until Christmas, till, till December. Um, base yourselves here. Um, and I, I think this is quite interesting. Foreign policy moves with Rwanda punching well above its, its weight. Egypt, main news that 
caught my attention in the last month or two was the the Russians finally coming back to uh, the tourist resorts. Flights got allowed back to Cairo some couple of years back already, but they weren't going to Sharm el-Sheikh, they weren't going to Haggadah, and now they are. And uh, there was, was it 250,000 a month used to be going in 2014-15. Uh, it's like 20%, 25%, maybe in some years 30% of all tourists going to Egypt were Russian. So if the Russians are going to come back, and I suspect the COVID differential in numbers isn't going to be that much of an issue, um, this, this could be very helpful. Because if the, if the tourism money starts to come back to, to Egypt, if the current account starts to improve because of that, the central bank doesn't need to keep market interest rates, encourage market interest rates to be quite so high. And if they don't need to do that, and interest rates come down, maybe local investors will say, oh, I quite like Egyptian equities instead of Egyptian bonds. Maybe banks could start lending again. Maybe that then tempts in some of the international uh, investors to, to take another fresh look at, at Egypt. So quite a big deal. Uh, and this, this is going to be an interesting set of data, the Russian tourist numbers over the next few months. Um, and I have to end with, with Kenya. It's, it's the best performing market in Africa in, in equity terms of the, of, the, of the ones we've been talking about, up about 22% year to date. Uh, Morocco's about 10, Egypt's roughly flat, um, and Nigeria's down a few percent. This is despite the Kenyan shilling weakening off uh, in the last uh, month or two, um, which I assume is connected to poor tourism, high oil prices, um, Yvonne will certainly be saying more about this soon. Um, we've got the all important 2022 elections looming. Um, I know people locally have been talking to me about these since before the last election. It was all going always going to be about 2022. Um, who takes off, over after Kenyatta? So this, this is going to be the story we'll be focusing on more and more. Um, and again, we've got a special session this week. Uh, just to to look at uh, that scenario. Um, I am going to be paying a lot of attention to it myself. Um, I recommend you do too. Um, so big picture, Africa's recovering, not quite as strong as the rest of the world in 2021, but that's because it wasn't hit as badly. Um, we've got the long-term stories that aren't changing, but I think the, the biggest shift we've seen in the last month or two is this special drawing rights story. So this is reducing default risk, um, you've also got commodity exporters doing pretty well uh, right now uh, with, with oil and copper and so on where, where they are. So it's a decent story. Um, we're going to hear an awful lot more about that and which companies are the ones to be looking at to benefit from it most. Thank you so much for joining uh, this, this video call and I will speak to you uh, in person at some point, I hope. Take care and see you soon. Bye. Knowledge is information, but not all information turns into knowledge. Today, every company leaves digital footprints in hundreds of different sources. But this information by itself does not tell you who it is you're looking at and what the risks of doing business with them are. Businesses can't exist in a vacuum. They need employees, customers, partners, contractors, investors. Good counter agents help a company succeed, create products, make profit, expand business opportunities. But what about bad ones? 49% of organizations around the world say that they've been victims of fraud or economic crime. Two thirds of Russian companies say they've encountered economic crime in the past two years. This is significantly higher than the global average. Every year, 15% of companies simply disappear, whether on their own initiative or because they're forced to do so by tax bodies often leaving unpaid debts. If you want to minimize your risk, you need to find and analyze every scrap of information you can. Identifying, analyzing, collecting facts. Processing big data is impossible without qualified specialists, experience, time, expensive equipment, new technology, machine learning, graphs. Spark Interfax gathers information from all available sources and converts it into knowledge, allowing you to see the world of business in its entirety with all its risks and opportunities. And there's no doubt 
that tomorrow we'll be able to understand the world of business even better thanks to the emerging digital economy, cutting-edge technology, and the availability of new information about the lives of companies. Knowledge decreases risks and creates trust. The foundation of any successful business. Knowledge is information, but not all information turns into knowledge. Today every company leaves digital footprints in hundreds of different sources. But this information by itself does not tell you who it is you're looking at and what the risks of doing business with them are. Businesses can't exist in a vacuum. They need employees, customers, partners, contractors, investors. Good counter-agents help a company succeed, create products, make profit, expand business opportunities. But what about bad ones? 49% of organizations around the world say that they've been victims of fraud or economic crime. Two-thirds of Russian companies say they've encountered economic crime in the past two years. This is significantly higher than the global average. Every year, 15% of companies simply disappear, whether on their own initiative or because they're forced to do so by tax bodies often leaving unpaid debts. If you want to minimize your risk, you need to find and analyze every scrap of information you can. Identifying, analyzing, collecting facts. Processing big data is impossible without qualified specialists, experience, time, expensive equipment, new technology, machine learning, graphs. Spark Interfax gathers information from all available sources and converts it into knowledge, allowing you to see the world of business in its entirety with all its risks and opportunities. And there's no doubt that tomorrow we'll be able to understand the world of business even better thanks to the emerging digital economy, cutting-edge technology, and the availability of new information about the lives of companies. Knowledge decreases risks and creates trust. The foundation of any successful business.
knowledge is information. But not all information turns into knowledge. Today, every company leaves digital footprints in hundreds of different sources. But this information by itself does not tell you who it is you're looking at and what the risks of doing business with them are. Businesses can't exist in a vacuum. They need employees, customers, partners, contractors, investors. Good counter agents help a company succeed, create products, make profit, expand business opportunities. But what about bad ones? 49% of organizations around the world say that they've been victims of fraud or economic crime. Two-thirds of Russian companies say they've encountered economic crime in the past two years. This is significantly higher than the global average. Every year, 15% of companies simply disappear, whether on their own initiative or because they're forced to do so by tax bodies often leaving unpaid debts. If you want to minimize your risk, you need to find and analyze every scrap of information you can. Identifying, analyzing, collecting facts. Processing big data is impossible without qualified specialists, experience, time, expensive equipment, new technology, machine learning, graphs. Spark Interfacts gathers information from all available sources and converts it into knowledge, allowing you to see the world of business in its entirety with all its risks and opportunities. And there's no doubt that tomorrow we'll be able to understand the world of business even better thanks to the emerging digital economy, cutting-edge technology and the availability of new information about the lives of companies. Knowledge decreases risks and creates trust. The foundation of any successful business. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, back to Renaissance Capital in Africa. Uh, sadly, again, not physically this time. Uh, we are again doing a, a Zoom conference. Um, although we've got, obviously got our offices in, in Nigeria, Kenya, and they're working hard on your behalf at all times, uh, along with South Africa and Egypt. Um, I'm delighted to launch the conference with, uh, I think, the best speaker um, on, on the issue of the day, um, and, and I think that's the special drawing rights increase that we saw in August. It's finally arrived. Uh, reserves have gone up for countries. This is a big deal. Um, we, we've been fully supportive of this idea. Um, and when I was trying to work out who could talk to us about that, uh, I couldn't think of anyone better than uh, Baby Selassie, who is the director of the African department at the IMF. Um, he's had a 23-year uh, history, I think, uh, at, at the IMF, and he's been all over the continent. Um, I think he had time in, in places as, ranging from Uganda to South Africa, as well as a host of the East European and other frontier markets that we've also, uh, we cover ourselves at Renaissance Capital. Um, so first, Abebe, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I really appreciate you giving us this time. Um, thank you, Charlie, for the invitation. Thank you, and for the kind words also. Well, it's, um, I, I, I think when you first bumped into each other at the BBC office like five years ago when you'd just been appointed, and that was, that was pretty cool um, coincidence for me too. But I, I wanted to start off um, by, can you, can you explain special drawing rights to me? Um, I've, I've obviously sent out emails to people, um, but there's nothing like hearing it from the man um, who, who's made such a difference for this in Africa anyway. And, and I'd love to just hear what are special drawing rights? Uh, what can they be used for? Uh, I'll have some more subsidiary questions after you've given us a little overview of what's just happened. Thanks, Charlie. So uh, it's not so much me, but really the, the IMF, but really the international community that 
is utilizing this uh, very important uh, toolkit in the IMS arsenal, uh, which has been used from time to time. Basically, special drawing rights are, if you will, um, uh, a, 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 a form of uh, a form of the international community together coming and using the balance sheet of the collective they call membership of the IMF 190 countries to say that you know we will uh, inject more liquidity globally uh, and this liquidity uh, can be used by those countries that need it uh, it's a way of uh, if you will kind of you know using the balance sheet of stronger countries uh, to support uh, other weaker countries, uh, th those that have uh, uh, pressing balance of payments need. And the way it works is that, you know, um, we credit almost every country the equivalent of its subscription or quota, as we call it in the IMF, um, with, or, or with resources. So if you're, uh, I don't know, uh, country X, you have a billion. If you're, you're the US, you have 100 billion. You get that much in special drawing rights. Uh, the US, you know, already has hard currency, doesn't need uh, to use reserves as much, um, much more inward looking economy. But country X uh, probably has a need uh, to to supplement its reserves or, uh, you know, so what will happen basically is that country X will be able to exchange its reserves, um, you know, its currency for US dollars. So it gets a, gains a hard currency, which it can then use to, to uh, you know, import goods and services to expand, uh, expand to create fiscal space, basically. Um, uh, so that's the mechanics of it. Why it's important right now, of course, uh, Charlie, is that, you know, um, we've seen over the last year and a half, um, uh, you know, the biggest shock, perhaps, to all economies. Right, uh, and those countries that have the the, the you know um, that are least resilient have been impacted even more exactly because they do not they have not um, uh, had the opportunity to 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 uh, expand central bank balance sheets, uh, go out and borrow as much as, uh, as say the U.S. Um, Euro Euro area countries, many uh, many um, other advanced countries have been able to. Um, so uh, an injection of uh, SDR at a time like this really is very, very uh, helpful, particularly for those countries with weaker balance sheets. Huh? Um, so uh, it comes at a really very important time as uh, the pandemic continues to to um, uh, persist uh, across the world. Um, uh, thankfully, uh, you know, the direct effect of the pandemic in, in our region in Africa has been not as much, except you know, countries like uh, South Africa, not as acute as elsewhere. But the economic effect has been as devastating, if not more so, exactly for the point I made earlier that countries have not had uh, the, the ability to uh, to cushion the effects of the pandemic on lives, livelihoods, uh, firms. So uh, it comes at a very, very important time. Uh, the effect basically is that, you know, uh, about $33 billion for Africa wide um, is being made available. It's very, you know, the amounts vary, I mean, depending on the size of the economy. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, there are also historic reasons why kind of it lags and not just directly correlated with GDP size. But, you know, it's a very important boost, very important uh, injection in the arms, as yeah. Kisalina, a shot in the arms, as Kisalina says, for economies that creates fiscal space uh, almost immediately. Um, so uh, we are very hopeful that uh, it will it will provide uh, quite a bit of support for countries. So we've got, I mean, we, we, we're just looking at the numbers. I think South Africa is the biggest uh, nominal beneficiary with something like $4 billion. Uh, Nigeria has got nearly three and a half billion dollars from this increase. Um, they, they can use that tomorrow they could go not necessarily to the fed they could go to the, the european central bank or even bank of china they could go exchange this for fx they can spend that fx on whatever urgent needs that they may feel are most appropriate and there's no restrictions here it's an unconditional injection of liquidity okay uh but of course so yes they can they can, they can do all of those things a couple of um not so much caveats but a couple of you know uh points in the past what has tended to happen is that sdr uh, because uh there is a, 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 you know right now interest rates are very low but there's a small payment that is due basically the weighted average interest rate of the yeah. currencies in the sdr basket which right now is close to zero but um over time that 
you know, if you use your SDRs, and over time, if interest rates go up, uh, there could be a little bit of a cost associated to the use of the SDR. So what countries have tended to do is that they put um, the SDRs at the bottom of the reserve pile, if you will, and they use reserves, which don't come, you know, free reserves, uh, other reserves, to um, go ahead and make, uh, you know, purchases of goods and services. So. 2009, when, when there was a $250 billion equivalent allocation, what we saw basically was SPRs being, um, being uh, at the bottom of the pile, allowing other free reserves to be used uh, easily. So, um, but, so this is a small caveat. Second, uh, and you know, more about policymaking um, uh, approaches, uh, and I think you know, the optimal policymaking approach. You know, when you have uh, windfall resource like this, Okay, we of course, you know, you want to make sure that you use it to address um, the, the pressing needs uh, of the moment. But as always, as always, you want to embed what you're doing in a medium term framework, right? Um, so I think, um, you know, uh, so countries, I think, you know, uh, I, I, unlike in the past when perhaps there was a lot more short termism in, in the conduct of macro policies in the region, I think countries are conscious, and I think some of, a lot of the conversations that we are having um, about how you use the resource in, a, in the best way possible. Is it by, you know, uh, you know, part of it could go towards immediately addressing, for example, you know, need to finance vaccinations, perhaps, or, you know, uh, uh, support for vulnerable people uh, uh, at the moment. But whatever you're doing, you want to embed it in a medium term framework. Uh, and then, you know, help ease that, you know, this will help you ease that medium framework, but you want to, to be consistent with what you're doing over the medium term. Very, very importantly. Uh, we are advising, and I, you know, we very much hope uh, countries also, uh, you know, do so in that direction. You do not want to use uh, this SDR to forestall, to delay required uh, or needed reforms. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, if you use it to, to, you know. Uh, Support an unsustainable exchange rate, or you know, do do um, yeah. fiscal policy that's not uh, that's not going to be beneficial over the medium to long term. That's not that's not optimal use. So, you know, there are those considerations that I think uh, we've been that, that you know we've we've been having a bit of a conversation around. But really, it's unconditional. Uh, You're still giving advice, even if it's well, not no, conditional. I mean, they it, they it, yeah. It's not you know. Uh, sorry, yeah. just to be very clear. Uh, there are, you know, uh, with some countries, we clearly have um, an arrangement uh, programs, uh, yeah. but in others, we have Article 4 policy dialogue. Yeah. Um, and this is not just, you know, so I, and other times kind of countries, uh, you know, we work very closely. We, we aspire to be trusted advisors to, to uh, um, the governments we serve. And, you know, we have conversations uh, and these are the kind of issues that uh, we discuss. That's, that's our... I might be asking too specific a question here, but um, I read from a Swedish central bank paper about SDRs some like 10, 15 years ago that Zimbabwe had actually used up all of its SDRs over at some point or another uh, previous allocations. Um, and I was wondering two or three things as a result of that. Does the IMF keep a track of what the actual SDRs still held by countries are versus, you know, that you've had the allocation? Do you keep track of who's actually got them still, because maybe Zimbabwe sold its last set of allocation to the states and, and then used that money to, to, to manage its you know, fiscal issues then. So the second question is, could Zimbabwe theoretically, or any country, go back to the Fed, having sold its SDRs to the, to the US to get dollars? Could it then go back and say, I want to go back, I want to get those SDRs back, please. Here are the dollars. Um, and we'd like to have them back on our books. And then thirdly, I mean, I saw something, and again, it's about Zimbabwe, but it needn't be. Uh, it could be about any, any number of countries. They owe a debt, I think, still to the IMF um, or the World Bank. C could they use the SDRs to kind of pave the way towards a, a improved relations with IFIs? I don't know exactly what Sudan's situation is, and, but, but you know, maybe there could be more than one country that 
So there's a few questions in there. I just want to, and if yeah. it's too specific. So, you know, in principle, the transactions between countries um, are, you know, uh, it is feasible to know what the SDR allocation of each country is and what the SDR holdings remain. And I think uh, that information uh, is public. I'm, uh, okay. It's been a while since I've. I've I, I can look on the website. Done, uh, um, second, you know, are these transactions reversible? Yes. Um, uh, between countries. Huh? I mean, it's, uh, you know, in, again, in principle, it is reversible. And then third uh, question about what reserves can be used for. I mean, first, uh, to set, yes, the resources can be used to settle um, uh, outstanding obligations with, you know, to the IMF, etc. But, you know, we, of course, uh, want countries to use these resources um, as much as possible to to address the pressing needs uh, that they have, right? Um, uh, so, yeah. uh, and you know, like countries you mentioned, uh, Sudan, etc. I mean, there is uh, uh, now kind of you know an arrears clearance uh, whole strategy that's been agreed uh, to to address um, to address the arrears that. Uh, were outstanding towards IMF, uh, Somalia also, if you remember, uh, uh, last year. So the hope is that, you know, um, the, these resources are going to be providing uh, and supporting increased uh, fiscal space uh, rather than just uh, addressing outstanding obligations to, the, to, the, to us. Got you. I thank you very much for getting the basics sorted. Um, at least I, I hope I've asked every question that people will have wanted me to ask. The second question I related to it is the even bigger one, which started, I think, with, with President Macron a few months ago saying, why does France need to get, you know, roughly $30 billion? We should, we'll, we'll, we'll hand that over as well. You know, we will reallocate France's SDR allocation to two countries in more need than France. Um, and it's not just France saying that now, it feels like that's that's quite a, a broad ranging agreement on this issue. You've got the IMF chief who was saying, I think she, she wanted proposals kind of in place by July. And I've been reading up about uh, uh, the resilience and, and growth trust um, as, as resilience and stability trust, sorry, which is perhaps a way, a, a, a mechanism that's being created to do this. Why couldn't the IMF just expand the poverty reduction and growth trust? which was an existing program. I'm, I'm just trying to understand, basically I'm trying to understand the mechanics of this, because oh, yeah. we could be talking hundreds of billions of dollars being reallocated. Are we? When? In what way would this money get used? Is it gonna be more conditional? I think it is, but please, I, I mean, I know very little and I'd love to know a bit more. So, you know, um... Very uh, deep question. So let me start by saying, yes, I mean, one of the really uh, good things that have uh, that uh, have uh, been happening over the last several months is recognition that um, there is going to be a need uh, for low-income countries, vulnerable countries around the economy uh, to have access to um, adequate financing to support uh, the reforms they need to do to, you know, enjoy a strong recovery to reverse a lot of the a lot of the um, deterioration in social uh, indicators, um, you know, uh, that have happened over the last year, year and a half. Huh? So I think international community uh, there is a recognition uh, of this, um, and um, so the question has been about you know how best to provide uh, this resource and. You know, the SDR allocation offers an opportunity to do this. Um, what is exciting also is the idea to go beyond the PRGT. In the past, if you will, uh, one of the ways in which previous SDR allocations have been used to channel resources from countries uh, that have comfortable reserve positions to those that don't has been uh, the poverty uh, reduction and growth trust that we have at the IMF, which basically uh, works exactly the way you you um, uh, you know exactly helps use. Uh, there's a proof of concept about how this could be done. Um, but there is a desire also to explore other ways in which even longer term financing could be done, perhaps financing uh, uh, that could go towards uh, a lot of the transformational 
um, infrastructure. Uh, things that countries need, you know, climate change, uh, for example, uh, type uh, challenges, uh, perhaps digitalization, you know, big medium term agenda, right, to, 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 um, to support resilience to shocks, to support the transformation that uh, really needs to be done uh, uh, in the coming years, if we are to, to not be susceptible to, to more, to more of these shocks. So, um, and, you know, we've got the mandate by the G20, um, uh, and with, you know, leaders like President Macron pushing very aggressively for, for the fund to, to be, um, uh, creative and thinking and coming up with ideas. Uh, we've also, you know, uh, so we've been working quite a bit, uh, quite a bit on coming up with proposals that, uh, that could entice, um, uh, countries that now are not using these SDRs to uh, to to allow us to use them to to support uh, more vulnerable countries. That's now the, the, the proposals are very tricky uh, because you know uh, in principle uh, you know it, it seems easy, but uh, as always the devil is in the detail, uh, and that's exactly what we're working at right now to find ways in which uh, you know um, every country has a different way of treating SDRs. Uh, in some countries, it's reserves. In some countries, it goes to the uh, to the you know the, the fiscal agent is the, the Ministry of Finance rather than the central bank. So coming up with a mechanism that's going to allow uh, as many countries as possible to provide the resources uh, consistent with the domestic legislations, and then we can you know we can find we, then we need to find a way uh, of on lending that it's a bit tricky but we're actively actively working on uh, on proposals it feels like I, I don't think it should matter but are the world bank saying get off our turf this is our space this kind of longer term financing structural change climate change uh, is there it feels you like know, everyone's uh, working together on this are they so you know uh, okay so uh, SDRs can be held by what are called proscribed institutions. And among the proscribed institutions that can hold SDRs are things like multilateral development banks, uh, you know, World Bank, uh, Development Bank, etc. So it's not, you know, again, that, that is also something that is being looked at. You know, is, is there a way in which, um, in which some SDRs could be allocated there? Um, so uh, just, but to be to to be uh, very um, uh, clear, Charlie, you know uh, the financing needs um, that you know prospectively face uh, low-income countries, um, developing countries more broadly in, in the coming years, really are so so large. Okay, mm -hmm. um, it's not stuff that can. It's not you know order, the orders of magnitude are not ones that are going to be made met just by the official sector. Okay, you know, so uh, the World Bank by itself cannot do it. The IMF, uh, even, you know, plus the World Bank, plus the IMF, plus African Development Bank, mm. uh, are, would only go a small way towards doing it, okay? Um, so I, I think this is a time when we all need to work together. Uh, so the World Bank, mm. I think, would strongly welcome whatever additional financing IMF can put um, yeah. Uh, to support a lot of the reforms that they also are working on. So I don't, it's not at all substitution that we're looking at here. Not at all. Okay. okay. Uh, and uh, the fact that the SDRs are perhaps more easily usable uh, than outright uh, grants uh, that IDA relies on to on them to countries also, um, you know, makes this rechanneling an attractive proposition for, for the international community. But, One last thing, you know, we've yes. been talking a lot about financing. Okay. And yes. I always worry, uh, uh, and I, this is something I really, really important to stress. You know, uh, the only way that, you know, uh, pr the primary way that uh, the region is going to enjoy strong growth uh, is through economic reforms, okay, is by identifying and alleviating the constraints on growth. Mm -hmm. And then financing is something that can help facilitate that okay so it's not just about financing but you know there's a very very important and deep um, reform agenda also uh, that's and in fact that's the primary driver of of uh, 
of growth prospects. Um, so, you know, I know you're, you want the financing discussion, but the other stuff is much more important. Yeah, no, I, look, I'm, I'm totally with you. And I think most of the investors I'd speak to would be much more in favor of this money being used um, sensibly and being used to support longer structural infrastructure needs to, to, to boost growth and to boost the potential for faster growth in the longer run and sustainable growth, um, not not quick wins or financing a pre-election budget. I mean, I, and I think that that's the issue of moral hazard that I think concerns some people about this reallocation of SDRs. You know, how is the money going to be? Is it, is it going to be potentially wasted? How can it be monitored? And I think if if what you're saying is you know, that we could see World Bank getting involved, African Development Bank getting involved, that could be quite a smart way of of delivery of infrastructure spend over time in a sustainable way. Uh, indeed, that indeed. that meets those moral hazard concerns um, would be the way I to see it um so to, to take this oh, well do we have any sense of timing i mean i can see it's tricky it feels like you've got a lot of institutions involved What's no, the so i think you know uh again they're very fans of work um you know so prdt um you know financing is one of those uh, i think that's at hand at least there's agreement on kind of the, the medium term envelope that will be needed for the prdt it will require some fundraising but that's like a, you know a concept that already has worked in the past mm -hmm. and so um that that i think uh, should happen you know uh, in a shorter time frame the resilience and sustainability trust is an entirely new trust huh? so uh, much will depend on how much um, uh, support it, it is going to engender um, so that is another bucket of uh, work and then there's also kind of you know the potential use of the SDR outside the IMF you know to, to uh, you know by other prescribed institutions that's yet another strand of work and all of these require quite a lot of detailed uh, work and negotiations etc but this is all happening as we speak I just to get to be a, a clearer sorry of my own head the PRGT feels like it was aimed particularly at the lowest income countries and it feels like from what i'm reading the resilience and stability trust might be a including low and middle income countries is that am i missing something am i uh, you know um the, the, the prdt is indeed aimed at low income countries but uh, there is a you know there's a horizon the lending um, horizon for that is 10 years basically ah, effectively okay, okay. Um, you know with the rsc the hope is that we uh, somewhat longer uh, uh, you know, uh, tenders could be explored. Um, uh, so, uh, but a lot of detail is still to be worked out. Okay. And so if I'm hoping for this to be all sorted at the October IMF meetings, that's too early, is it? You know, I, I really would, you know, uh, it's difficult to say, really difficult okay. to say, but you know, <laughs> these things take, do take uh, quite a bit of time to, to concept, you know, to just conceptualize and then get the commitment i'm sorry to put you on the spot sorry i look moving on moving on um yeah. we've got this uh situation of, of high commodity prices places like nigeria looking better zambia already doing well before before the uh, surprise election result um so number of countries are getting a benefit from this uh, it feels to me that senegal is, is likely to get its energy that stalled energy project back on track um with, with oil prices up here so this is all looking pretty good for quite a quite a lot of countries and now we've got the sdr increase suddenly making everyone look like a little bit of a better credit than they did a month ago um and the prospect of a bit more coming about through this reallocation of funds at some point so the concerns i had early this year that when chad uh, then ethiopia and zambia all are looking for g20 debt forgiveness not just the debt moratorium on an interest where it got rescheduled, what, five years in the future, but actually a debt forgiveness. And the question was, who's next? It feels like, am I rash to say there may be no one next in the next year or two? You know, uh, two years ago, who expected this shock? <laughs> right? I mean, or five years ago, who expected the commodity price slump, right? So, uh, you know, never say never. Uh, I mean, or rather, you know, you really always have to be a bit circumspect, right? Um, so just 
on 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 that issue, you know, I I I always I have to say worry about kind of uh, the the association of you know, uh, you know this the death picture as you know is extremely extremely heterogeneous, okay, uh, in in the region. Um, second, we have gone through a period of incredible shock, okay. Uh, the likes of which you know we haven't seen over the last hundred years. I think it's absolutely no surprise that you have countries getting into trouble. In fact, the question is like, how come more, even more countries yeah. have not gotten into trouble, right? Um, in terms of being able to service their debt as comfortably as as what had been expected, uh, you know, in the pre-crisis uh, scenarios on which activity was being based, uh, sorry, projections were being based, lending decisions, investment decisions were being based. So um, going forward, a lot will also depend on how we move away from this period of continued heightened uncertainty that we remain in, okay? Um, so some things are looking up, you know, it's surprising how much financing conditions have remained easy for much, much broader swathe of countries than we would have expected six, nine months ago, if you remember, uh, like everybody thought kind of that was it, right? And, and, you know, um, commodity prices have picked up. It will help countries that are commodity exporters. Uh, but again, you know, this approach, monocausal uh, sense that Africa is all about commodities is not right. So mm. as much as, uh, you know, when oil prices go up, Nigeria and you know, even Chad will benefit. You have the likes of Nigeria or uh, Malawi who import oil. You know, that's a negative terms of trade shock. So again, um, a lot will depend on kind of, you know, country specific factors, the growth trajectory, the reform endeavor, uh, how much they're addressing the need to mobilize more revenues, mm. um, how much exports are, uh, are uh, growing um, as it does on the global picture and, you know, uh, or uh, financing that is available um, from capital markets, IMF, etc. So always when it comes to the debt sustainability picture, uh, just as we do not look at blanketly at Latin America and and think of it as a class of uh, as, a, as an entire class. Yes, I mean, you know, some commonalities, uh, but I think uh, in, 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 in our region also, we, much is going to depend really on the country specific uh, trajectories that uh, that uh, they will be on, um, and it's going to interplay between all of these complex factors that will determine uh, the debt uh, approach. Now, uh, what the G20 initiatives were designed to do was at the height of um, that uh, that uh, period of uncertainty we were in last year. Huh? Um, they were designed. But to allow, I mean, the DSSI was allowed to effectively uh, allow breathing space to countries, right? Um, and it was really much, much needed breathing space by the official sector at least. Uh, the private sector was, uh, you know, invited to participate if they so need, but, you know, didn't. But it gave countries a lot of breathing space, which, you know, could be used to, to uh, support um, families, to support uh, small, medium-scale enterprises. And then came the common framework, uh, G20 common mm -hmm. framework, where again, uh, something that has been lacking, right? I mean, you have had the Paris Club, but not quite uh, the rest of the official sector, uh, having a way in which it could provide, um, uh, it would provide uh, possibilities for debt restructuring. Uh, so I think it really is, was an important innovation, okay? bringing in other G20 creditors to say that, you know, in those countries where there is a strong need for uh, debt relief, uh, for uh, debt restructuring, then the official sector will do this. Okay. Um, so, you know, uh, it, it has, so it's important to contextualize what those things were about. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't, uh, um, doubt, I don't doubt, okay, uh, that there will be countries that will continue to have uh, debt difficulties uh, and will need debt treatment. Mm. But again, much will depend on, uh, as I said, the economic outlook, uh, global economic environment, and to be the interplay of those things. One last thing I wanted to say is, you know, uh, we should welcome things like the G20 Common Initiative exactly because, you know, in much the rest of the universe, uh, 
uh, we do not have frameworks, right? Yeah. We do not have it becomes transparent, uh, systems, right? That yeah. would allow debt restructurings. And you know, uh, as you know, uh, debt restructuring, sovereigns and requiring, um, you know, uh, space is not unique to Africa. I mean, you know, no, no, no. Uh, I so, Still worried about Sri Lanka right now, but but again, the the the, uh, the SDR increase helps short term. Um, that that was a an answer that was really good at forcing me to read between the lines of what you were saying, and I, I'm going to have to have a think about um, what it implies. But it no, it feels it feels like the, you're saying a framework is there, and with other G20 countries, and and we can guess which one is the most important of them. Um, there is now a framework that that feels like it's working better from your perspective you know I, uh, a framework was needed it is there yeah. we hope you know uh, you know so uh, it is important to to make sure that this framework remains in place so that countries that you know face difficulty can use the framework to to be able to move forward it's in nobody's interest as you know uh, least of all the countries least of all the people in you know these four countries um, to have uh, you know unsustainable debt burdens uh, you know, just uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, drag being a drag on growth on 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 uh, yes. livelihoods forever and ever. It's not in the interest of creditors either, right? Indeed. What um, I I wanted to give a little bit of space here for you to elaborate on a proposal that you co-authored with some others um, on the IMF blog. Um, and I am going to make sure there's a link to that um, for for clients when they when they read around this this. TV interview. Um, how to attract private finance to Africa's development. Um, you're absolutely on board with, I think, what many of us are about how to get money in in an affordable way that doesn't lead to damaging debt default and all of the other problems a few years down the line. Um, could you briefly explain what you were thinking in your co authored piece? Okay, so uh, really a lot of the work um, goes to my course, it's Luke Hero and uh, Kathy Patillo, uh, who have been, you know, who've done really uh, great work thinking about um, uh, this challenge. As I uh, mentioned earlier, you know, the development financing needs of, of uh, our countries, even before this crisis, were tremendous, right? Um, there's a huge need to invest in infrastructure, in health, in education. Um, a whole gamut of things by countries uh, and of course there's a limit as to how much the public sector can do this okay uh, even with the best of wills and you know huge effort to raise uh, revenues there is still going to be need for significant private sector investment um, in uh, in uh, development areas to help reach the sustainable development goals okay um, so and I want to be very clear. Huh? I think we do expect uh, the state to be the provider of the lion's share of public goods and services, right? Uh, but uh, if we want to meet the sustainable development goals uh, by 2030, it is almost imperative um, that additional resources are also go into electricity generation, bridge building, ports, etc. Okay, so it really, really is important because one of the ways we're going to meet SDGs is through high, high rates of growth. Uh, that needs to be facilitated by, uh, you know, commerce, by trade. So, uh, you know, uh, hard investments in these areas are important. When we look at the picture in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the contribution of the private sector towards, um, you know, big infrastructure projects, etc., is really very, very low. Um, I, about five percent compared to you know uh, significantly more in Latin America, in Asia, uh, and the like. And the reasons for this are really very, very varied. Uh, in some cases, it's risk appetite not being there, uh, financial uh, domestic markets not being deep enough to to have uh, longer tenures that you need. Uh, you know because the horizon for these investment projects really are very long. Um, and of course, you know. Uh, there are implementation difficulties also in the region. I mean, I was just uh, in Berlin uh, uh, for the Compact with Africa meeting uh, the other day, and uh, I saw finally the, the new airport has been completed 10 years yeah. after yeah. it was originally due to be completed. Eh? Yeah. So imagine if Germany, with all of their efficiency, with all of the human capital, 
uh, have difficulty doing large infrastructure projects. Imagine, you know, uh, the kind of challenges that you face sometimes with some projects in, 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 in the region. So there's also the risk is non-trivial, right? Um, so we've been thinking about this and um, how can the, you know, how can we entice the private sector to do more uh, in the region? Um, I think first and foremost, it's about uh, you know, uh, nothing new, uh, getting, make sure that you have projects that are viable, uh, that are well articulated with high rates of return, that you can, you know, get private sector to come in, create a regulatory environment that will, that will um, facilitate uh, this uh, kind of investment. Uh, second, also to explore possibilities in which, you know, a small portion of the government balance sheet could perhaps be used to, to help um, entice these investments. Now, this is something you want to be very, very careful about, uh, think through deeply. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, our governments give a lot of tax incentives uh, to uh, private enterprises, right? Um, why not consider, uh, consider uh, ways in which uh, the government can perhaps address uh, some, some of the some of the costs in public sector projects. There's already quite a bit of that, but you know, we just you know we want to provoke thinking. We want to provoke debate um, uh, in this area. Um, the last point, you know, really that I want to make is that you know uh, it's not completely uh, beyond the pale what we're saying. And I want to cite the example of uh, of telecoms, right? I mean, it's again, nothing new. It's a well-known example. Uh, we've seen how much telecom uh, access has increased in the world, in you know, in Africa, right? I mean, more so than almost anywhere uh, in terms of um, you know uh, telecom penetration. A lot of it, of course, has to do with technology. Okay, but uh, it, you know, technology by itself uh, would have been out there, uh, you know, if the private sector had not also uh, invested, right? Um, it wouldn't have been absorbed as much. The public sector would have been slower to, to perhaps introduce telecom services uh, in, in, uh, in our region. So uh, we want to basically, um, you know, cite that I think as a model where there's always trade-off between access and, and, um, and price. Uh, but, you know, I think, you know, in terms of how uh, effective te the telecom revolution has been, how effective the private sector has been in providing such important services, uh, introducing it, expanding it uh, uh, in, in the region, I think, you know, uh, it's just, it, it can be done. Huh? It can be done. And, you know, so it's about thinking about, you know, what is, what is the equivalent of airtime cards uh, for uh, energy um, to improve electricity access. Again, these are things that are taking place uh, on the ground and, uh, you know, facilitating those will be important going forward um, uh, to, to make sure that the region's financing needs are addressed. Yes. And I, I, I remember as a kid having a, a meter that we had to put money in to, to get our supply of electricity by the hour. And if you didn't put the cash, if you didn't have the coins at home, you, you could go dark for, for the night. Um, so I, I do think there's got to pay, pay things work. But the technology thing could also be changing in a positive way on energy was, was one of my thoughts about this, that the old way of doing electricity generation was a massive grid, huge generation plant, very expensive. And to make money on, you had to be secure on your revenue stream for many, many, many years. And it feels like with solar plunging cost of things like solar, possibly wind energy as well, that, that maybe a return could be made more quickly. And for private sector investors who are a little bit nervous about taking a 20 year view, that becomes a, if it's a five year potential payback on a, mm. on a solar project, that much smaller, but, but potentially becomes an easier way of getting that capital in as well. Um, so, you know, the, the way I see it is that there's going to be a need for uh, multiple sources of electricity generation, multiple approaches, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the government, I mean, I, I, you know, given uh, how uh, limited electricity access remains in the region, yeah. there, need, there will continue to be need for, you know, these very large scale infrastructure and energy generation, hydro projects, etc. hopefully greener and greener projects, but there will still be a need to add a lot more energy generation capacity in the region. Okay, so, um, the, but 
you can also find, you know, microgrids, the points that you made, you know, about, you know, smaller solar grids for smaller towns, et cetera. That perhaps where there is scope for the private sector to, to supplement yeah. what the state is going to be doing. Um, so I see, you know, that, that's how I see. So, you know, uh, and, you know, if 15, 20% of, uh, of uh, our energy generation need can be done by the private sector, that would allow significant fiscal space for the government to do some of the harder things which the, for the private sector to do, which is like, you know, uh, investing in uh, hospitals, in schools, in universities, which, uh, you know, we need more and more of given the, given the size of the population uh, growth. Size of yeah. the population growth. Yeah. And then one last thing I want to make to your investors, lest they, they you know, uh, you know how much I, 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 uh, I, uh, I'm an advocate of this. You know, five, six years ago, uh, my, my, um, then boss and I wrote a piece called uh, The African Century, uh, uh, the, about this century. You know, uh, and th that was motivated really by one, uh, stunning for me, uh, uh, number, uh, uh, which is that by 2030, so in, you know, nine, 10 years, one out of every two new entrants into the global labor market will be from sub-Saharan Africa, not even the whole of Africa, but sub-Saharan Africa. Okay. Um, the, the, this at the same time that global working age population is aging so, so rapidly. Okay. Uh, well, you know, uh, I cannot think of uh, a, a, an area, a region globally where there is going to be so much uh, demand for consumer goods, investment goods than Africa. Uh, going forward. Yeah? So uh, one way or another, that will manifest itself, right? Uh, this demand, uh, this uh, this pressure. And, you know, I cannot think of, of uh, more important, more interesting business opportunity than that. Then again, of course, I'm talking my book a bit. Uh, but, <laughs> it's a beautiful way to end this session. Um, so, uh, Avivir Selassie, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'm really grateful. And we hope to see you again um, and Thanks, all of the money coming in too. Thanks. is information, but not all information turns into knowledge. Today, every company leaves digital footprints in hundreds of different sources. But this information by itself does not tell you who it is you're looking at and what the risks of doing business with them are. Businesses can't exist in a vacuum. They need employees, customers, partners, contractors, investors. Good counter-agents help a company succeed create products, make profit, expand business opportunities. But what about bad ones? 49% of organizations around the world say that they've been victims of fraud or economic crime. 
Two-thirds of Russian companies say they've encountered economic crime in the past two years. This is significantly higher than the global average. Every year, 15% of companies simply disappear, whether on their own initiative or because they're forced to do so by tax bodies often leaving unpaid debts. If you want to minimize your risk, you need to find and analyze every scrap of information you can. Identifying, analyzing, collecting facts. Processing big data is impossible without qualified specialists, experience, time, expensive equipment, new technology, machine learning, graphs. Spark Interfacts gathers information from all available sources and converts it into knowledge, allowing you to see the world of business in its entirety with all its risks and opportunities. And there's no doubt that tomorrow we'll be able to understand the world of business even better thanks to the emerging digital economy, cutting-edge technology and the availability of new information about the lives of companies. Knowledge decreases risks and creates trust. The foundation of any successful business. Hello everyone, welcome to our 12th annual Pan-Africa Investor Conference. My name is Yvonne Mohango and I am Renaissance Capital's Africa Economist and Head of Africa Research. Thank you for joining us for the panel discussion that I'll be moder moderating today, titled Navigating an Economic Recovery Amid a Pandemic. I'm delighted to introduce my esteemed panelists, Mr. Tobias Rasmussen, the IMF's resident representative in Kenya, and Dr. Hassan Mahmoud, Director of the Monetary Policy Department at the Central Bank of Nigeria. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about my panelists. Mr. Tobias Rasmussen has been with the IMF since 2001, working on a wide range of countries. Prior to his current assignment as IMF rep to Kenya, he was mission chief for Guinea-Bissau and had before that worked on Ghana and Zambia. He has also worked on countries in the IMF's Asian, Middle Eastern, Western Hemisphere and European departments. Tobias Rasmussen holds a PhD in economics from Aarhus University in Denmark. Tobias, I'm sure I mispronounced your alma mater. Apologies there. Dr. Mahmoud Hassan is the director of the Monte Policy Department at the Central Bank of Nigeria. He currently serves as the secretary of Nigeria's Monetary Policy Committee. Prior to his current role, he was a group head, macro prudential analysis, 
of macroprudential analysis in the financial policy and regulation department of the central bank. Between 2010 and 2015, he was the special advisor to the governor on economic policy and research. Dr. Mahmoud has a PhD degree in economics from the University of Surrey, United Kingdom. Welcome, gentlemen, and thank you again for making yourselves available for this discussion. To start off our discussion, I'd like to invite each panelist to give us a brief overview of how their respective economies are doing or are fared during this particular uh, pandemic. I'd also just like, uh, before we begin, uh, to mention to those that have called in that if you have any questions, please uh, put them through on our comment box on our YouTube channel or email our PR team. Um, but anyway, well, let's get started. And uh, I'll ask Tobias to start giving his overview of the uh, Kenyan economy. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne, and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity here. Um, yeah, so, so, so a, a quick overview of, of developments in, in Kenya. Um, I, I, I think, as with the rest of the world, uh, obviously, the, the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic was a, a big shock for the, the Kenyan economy. Uh, we saw that economic activities took a significant hit with disruptions to trade, transport, movement restrictions, school closures, all that. Uh, but what I, I would emphasize now is that uh, from what we're seeing, the shock appears to have been relatively short-lived uh, with activity recovering robustly. Um, Year-on-year, year, real GDP growth contracted by 5.5% in, in the second quarter of, of last year. Um, that was the quarter where uh, the shock uh, really was felt. But we then saw improvement to minus 1.1% in the third quarter. Um, we are yet to see GDP results for Q4 or beyond but uh, a range of indicators points to a, a strong rebound in activity and one that has gathered pace in, uh, in this current year. COVID is not over, of course. Um, case numbers are still high, uh, and it's only a small fraction of the Kenyan population that has been vaccinated. But from an economic perspective, it seems that firms and people have, to a large extent, uh, been able to adjust and, and get on with, with business. On the domestic side, activity seems in many ways back to, to normal. Traffic in Nairobi, my favorite indicator, is certainly as intense as, as ever. We're seeing a recovery in, in various production indicators too. Output of cement and electricity point to a significant increase in, in output over the past year. PMI numbers have been consistently above 50 in expansion territory, except for a dip in April when we went through a, a third wave of, of COVID. On the external side, we've been seeing solid growth in both exports and imports. Horticulture exports, which are important here in Kenya, have been doing particularly well. Um, imports, which had fallen when the pandemic hit, uh, have subsequently increased across all categories, reflecting general pickup in activity, robust demand. In the financial area, credit to the private sector has been expanding, uh, slowly, but expanding. And the ratio of non-performing loans has been broadly stable. Deposit growth has been strong and mobile money uh, usage has increased sharply. The fiscal area is, is one that came under a lot of pressure initially. Uh, this was driven by a sharp reduction in, in revenue that bottomed towards the middle of, of last year. That was reflecting the reduced economic activity as, as well as lower tax rates uh, implemented to cushion the impact on, on the population. But the picture there in, in, in the fiscal area has been improving alongside the recovery activity. 
um, and also the COVID tax cuts mostly ended at the start of, of, of this year, so uh, revenue has, has been picking up quite strongly. The overall deficit for the fiscal year, which ended in June, came in slightly below the budgeted 8.7% of, of GDP. So all in all, um, I, I think we can say that the economy seems to be moving along. Uh, with growth returning and, and the private sector back to business. COVID is not over by any means. And, and, and that, of course, means a, a still high degree of uncertainty about the outlook and, and hence need for, for caution. A, a, a key challenge will be to stay the course on, on the flat, planned fiscal consolidation. Uh, government debt in Kenya was already high pre-COVID and then increased further as a result of, of the widening deficits last year. So reducing the deficit as, as planned will be critical to lowering debt vulnerabilities. The recent fiscal results uh, are encouraging, but this will be a multi-year effort. Also, I, I, I would point to that there are still some pockets of, of, of weakness in the economy, uh, tourism perhaps being the most obvious area. Um, airport arrivals have been picking up, uh, but they are still below half of, of pre-COVID levels. Uh, and a full recovery in that area still seems far away. So um, to sum up, I, I, I think there are certainly some significant challenges remaining, um, but also a, a, a lot of encouraging pro progress. Let me end there. Thanks. Thanks, Tobias. Uh, that does sound encouraging indeed. We'll dig into some of the challenges, including on the fiscal side, uh, during our session. Um, um, Dr. Mahmoud, I'd like to invite you to give an overview of Nigeria. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And, uh... I'm happy to be here with you all. Um, I think for Nigeria, the, the, the statistics are not too different from that of Kenya. Um, the shock came even prior to the shock. Uh, the, there are a lot of fragilities already in the economy, given that before the crisis, we had this uh, oil price war in Saudi Arabia and the Russia, and we see oil prices coming down to $14 a barrel on such February, March of uh, 2020. And uh, we're battling with that. Uh, there are also issues around the uh, fiscal space in terms of meeting the huge infrastructural deficits. There are also some issues around the banking system. And then COVID landed and that uh, panicked everything and then uh, truncated all the numbers uh, southwards. Um, in the first uh, quarter of 2020, 2020, we saw our GDP from 2.55 to 1.89. By the second quarter, we enter the negative GDP of uh, minus 6.01. That picked up by the third quarter to minus 3.3, uh, 3, I think. And then by the fourth quarter, we are out of the recession. So. We also recorded the recession in 2020. But first, by the fourth quarter, we had a 0.11 out of that. Uh, and by the first quarter of 2021, this year, um, we came out a bit stronger again with a 0.51. And by the second quarter statistics that we got from the National Bureau of Statistics just a few weeks back, we're doing 5.01. So technically, we're out of that. The, the forecast for the year is still even the IMF forecast is still going to be above uh, between 2.5 to 3% for 2021. So we came out of that. Uh, all the parameters, all the microeconomic indicators uh, include issues around inflation. Uh, we, we are having a downward trend in inflation before the COVID. And up, even though it was still not a single digit, uh, we were projecting the preferred uh, threshold was to have a single digit 6 to 9%. That's what we feel is uh, comfortable for sustainable growth. Uh, but even before then, we had a 12.46. Um, COVID came, it shot over 18% uh, in terms of our inflation number. I mean, headline inflation now. 
I'm largely driven by both food and core inflation, or core inflation measures, issues around the energy prices, electricity, PMS, petroleum uh, usage at the, at the domestic economy, at the retail end, and then you have uh, some you know, measures that were taken to liberalize the power sector. So we saw some jack up in price. Those translated to the inflation numbers we got. And we had the major issues, apart from the legacy uh, structural issues in the economy in, stand, in terms of supply rigidity, we had the, the crisis that later came around banditry, kidnapping and stuff like that. And that stopped you know, the production of food. There was production going on at the early stages, but getting those produce to the market was also an issue. So that also fed into, so food inflation was a major player there. Um, but in recent times, uh, we see month on month, inflation numbers also coming down, we're right? still so around 17.38% uh, as at the last uh, August numbers, or July numbers, yeah. Uh, we expect that to go further to so around 13 or, or so, and by next year we should be crossing the borderline of a single of a single digit for the inflation numbers. Other domestic prices include the the, the FX rate. Um, you may be aware that we also had some adjustments in terms of the rates because the demand pressure were just not uh, couldn't meet up with that. Um, there were you know issues around revenue inflow. The largest source of uh, FX inflow to Nigeria is from oil export proceeds that goes to government, which is uh, sold to the central bank. And we use that to do interventions at the FX market and all the supply issues. So around those supply side constraints were also huge demand pressure. So you see that this equilibrium widening for, for a period of time. And the only you know strategic move to do was to make some adjustment because had this rate we call official rate which was way above uh, the, the rate that was prevailing in the market that rate was not supposed to be a transactional rate it was supposed to be a rate that was just to you know clear government transactions including you know payments of uh, memberships or estacos to government workers but we see that margin widening substantially and issues were around you know rates not converging in the market so we had some adjustments to narrow that uh, and also moderate the the demand pressure, and then we see the rates now going around. We have all what you call the NAFEX rate. We have the importers and investors and exporters window, and that is the, the wholesale in the market for FX or the major market for uh, foreign exchange transactions within the bank, both from the demand and supply side. And that rate, the NAFEX, the rate that prevailed in America called the NAFEX rate, and that rate is now moderating to around 410, 412. Um, over this period. We have also another segment we call the BDC. Uh, it's been existing, but the, the funny thing about that was the central bank was the one funding that market. And we also see this arbitrage building from the official rate and the NAFEX rate getting into that. So we couldn't differentiate between the BDC market, which is the Bureau de Chion market, and the parallel market. So, you know, there's this confusion. Everybody calls the BDC the parallel market because that's the rates that uh, most uh, informal activities are anchored on. So we see that also giving pressure to to, to other um, fundamentals of the economy. There's a, a high pass through from exchange rate depreciation to inflation. So we see that also impacting our inflation uh, numbers coming in from the monetary uh, fundamentals that are affecting inflation apart from the structural issues I mentioned. On the external side, we also recorded a huge deficit of five point uh, so billion dollars that narrowed by the first quarter of 2021 um, to around one billion dollars. So technically, that sector is growing, but we've still not reached the threshold of getting out of that projection. So that by the third quarter, we we'll start seeing uh, positive numbers uh, because of the lock lockdown and the monetary stimulus that came in, both fiscal and monetary. We saw a pickup in importation, so importation bills also drive the, the balance of payment position there to, to that skewing it to, to where you see exports not growing, but you see huge import, uh, import bills. Some of them are tied to importations of machineries and stuff like that, even interventions, because we had a lot of interventions, both monetary and fiscal to the agricultural sector, manufacturing sector, aviation, power sector. So we see 
a lot of activities going on. The COVID brought about some lockdown. Technically, we had two major lockdowns in the economy. One lasted close to four months, and that was the you know biggest uh, hit on the economy because economic activity just went down. Interventions are already in trillions of naira, so now it will be billions of uh, dollars, and that is still ongoing. Monetary expansion. Uh, there was no major adjustment in monetary policy rate per se, but the quantitative easing were also kind of expansionary move on the side of the central bank. But the financial system, we also had, uh, they were more resilient than other sectors of the economy. Uh, while we saw negative performance in most of the sectors, including the SMEs and, and the huge number of unemployment that uh, came from that, the banking sector was a bit more resilient. There were a lot of controls within the banking uh, sector, consolidation activities even before the crisis, and uh, there was uh, a limit to what activities bank could do, purely financial intermediation. Uh, they don't go into um, pension activities, they don't go into capital market activities. So there was that, you know, guard into that activity. So, so they were a bit more resilient. However, they were also because of exposure to the oil and gas and manufacturing, we saw MPL numbers uh, picking up gradually. Some of the capitals, capital adequacy ratios were, you know, showing some fragility. So we, we had some forbearances for banks that were exposed to COVID-related businesses. That forbearances are still going on. Um, stress tests were done to see how sustainable the industry is. And um, lastly, on the fiscal side, that was also just like uh, Kenya case was. Big uh, holes were there. We're having uh, issues, even though we, the, the G, uh, debt to GDP ratio is still below uh, 20, 30%. We see debt servicing to GDP of to revenue building up substantially. Um, substantial part of the public debt raising were domestic, in the sense that we're also concerned about, uh, even though concessionary uh, facilities are a lot more uh, cheaper and more sustainable, but we're also concerned about issues around exchange rate and the, the FX liquidity market. So we see a huge uh, part of that uh, debt coming from the domestic uh, economy. I think, uh, let me not talk too much, um, our external reserve position um, was still kind of uh, stable. We were below $30 billion before the crisis, during 28-29. That stabilized around $33 billion during the crisis period. Uh, the IMF uh, facility came in, support came in, rapid uh, response support came in, $3.5 billion. Uh, last year, this year, we have the SDR, another $3.35 billion. So we have our reserve around $37 billion now. It's a bit less than $37 billion, um, largely owned by the central bank anyway. So those those. Uh, issue, those, those are funds that also are used to, you know, a moderate movement in the exchange rate. We're doing a managed floating rate, but we still have some instances of interventions to, to moderate that uh, excessive uh, demand pressure. I think generally that is, is a picture of what we have. Uh, stability is coming in at uh, the capital market. We also saw some bearishness that uh, came from the global uncertainties. Uh, it's a large invest uh, foreign uh, holdings of uh, capital market equities in Nigeria and that uh, actually was was a major issue for, also for the for the central bank in terms of the exchange rate uh, demand that came in the capital reversals that came from there so so many other things around that area the market are also uh, resuming some moderations all the headlines have been muted I mean Headwinds have been muted now, but uncertainties still remain. There are some tailwinds that are also picking up some of those numbers. Well, at least we could see some level of um, stability coming in, both at the macroeconomic level, output growth, and on the financial system stability side. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, that was quite extensive, and I think I'll go straight into Q&A. And in this time, I'm going to address some of the questions that um, uh, our investors think are, up, I think are pertinent. So, Hassan, I'll start with yourself, and it will be related to FX, uh, which is not a surprise to you. Uh, my question to you is, what is your response to those that say Nigeria's multiple FX rates, limited FX flexibility, and FX shortages are problematic? 
Um, well, that, that, that's a valid observation. I must, uh, must confess to that. Um, but there are, other, there, there are some domestic uh, idiosyncratic characteristics of the Nigerian economy that inform that. One, like I mentioned in the, in the in overview I just did, the supply side is highly restricted. Uh, it's a mono, kind, mono uh, economy in the sense that the largest inflows are coming from uh, oil revenue. We see the volatility in that side. Uh, it's also important to note that the growth trajectories I just gave were largely driven by the non-oil sector. And oil sector contribution to the economy now is less than 7-8%. Uh, so we see that diversification already coming on board, services, trade, uh, commerce, manufacturing, driving that so that the inflows now of FX that will go through export are, are getting more sustainable and, and, and reliant. So that is the supply side. We also have a huge demand side uh, problem in the sense that every other thing in the economy is being imported, uh, including things that uh, are to do with luxuries and other things that are just not essential. So you see the domestic economy not growing or, or backward integration not crystallized, even from the oil sector. So deliberate efforts were made to provide effects for some sectors that we, we regarded as critical, real sectors, including SMEs. So we created some windows to address that temporarily, particularly like the SMEs that we want to grow as the largest employer of labor here, created a, a small window for that. And then we now created the i &E window which I just mentioned earlier, and that's where the bulk of the activity is coming. The BDC window, the Bureau de Chien, was supposed to sell, you know, activities of less than $5,000 for basic travel allowance, business travel allowance. It's not supposed to be for opening LCs or, or doing importations and stuff like that. So we have those buckets that uh, were just uh, administrative measures to manage excessive demand within the economy. However, as we speak today, there's the real convergence uh, in terms of the rates in those, in those markets. Because even the official window that I mentioned earlier is anchored on NAFEX now. So government transactions are on NAFEX plus a margin, and then the, the major market for FX transactions is the INE window. And rates at that market has been a lot stable. Even during the crisis, we were doing $300 million a day in that market, even though there was crash. We used to do billions of dollars there. So, for now, I can say we just have that NAFEX window and every other rate are anchored on that, uh, on that NAFEX rate. So convergence is coming. Yes, there are issues before now, but uh, we've seen a lot of stability in that uh, rate. We don't, we're not really bothered much about our valuation on the valuation we expect market fundamentals to determine that. What we are more interested in is the supply side and the integrity of the financial system in terms of the confidence that investors will have in that market to be able to bring in their funds and take out their funds when they want to go out with it. So that supply side and transparency of the market was was key. Thank you for that. Um, what if I was to argue in response to that point that uh, the supply side could be helped if the market felt that the Naira was rightly valued um by that i mean if it was trading at its fair value as opposed to being overvalued um as it is today um is that something the central bank uh, considers is it of interest for the central bank to see the naira to move towards its fair value would we estimate to be around 458 naira to the dollar well it depends on who is doing the econometrics and it depends on the underlying assumptions and objective of that uh, estimation uh, from our side like i like i mentioned earlier uh, issues around overvaluation on the valuation will be determined by the forces of demand and supply um, but if you have issues of instrumental market failure then that price discovery role of the market is, is lost within that uh, crack in the transmission. So it, it will not be wise for you to sit down for the fundamentals to do that. So that's why you have uh, that managed flow thing and you know, some kind of interventions that come into it because of this uh, characteristics of market failure. Um, for overvaluation, yes, if we have moved from 390 something to where we are for uh, 100 and something now, then there must be issues of overvaluation earlier on. 
But at the level we are now, we expect that this is a reflection of the demand and supply within the market. If market fundamentals dictate uh, differently, uh, we expect the market to flow in that direction. However, what is important is the liquidity and transparency of that, uh, of that market. Thank you very much for those responses. I'll move along to Kenya now, Tobias. Uh, Tobias, tomorrow is a big day for Kenya. Um, they'll be publishing their rebased GDP numbers. Um, the last GDP release was in January, and that was for the third quarter of the year. And the delay since then is because um, the authorities, I'd imagine, have been preparing these numbers. Um, the last time we saw Kenya rebase, when they announced, uh, was in 2014. Um, they rebased from a uh, uh, base year of 2001 to 2009 at the time, and uh, apparently the new base will be 2016. But the last time they did rebase, we saw the GDP being revised up uh, by 25%. So it was quite significant at the time, to $55 billion. Um, today, the size of the economy, at least uh, at the end of 2020, is $100 billion. And um, my question to you is, what are your expectations of the rebased uh, GDP numbers? be it size or be composition, growth rate, do you have any expectations that you can share with us? Well, let's see tomorrow yeah. when, when the, the numbers come out. Um, I mean, I, I would really just point to uh, that the, the rebasing exercise that uh, Kenya has been undertaking uh, is, is one that's been underway for some time. It, 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 it's uh, a significant piece of, of work. It, it's something they've been working on for, for several years, in fact. Uh, these exercises are recommended practice uh, every five, 10 years uh, to, to, to update the, the basis for, for the national accounts. Um, so I, I, I see it really as, as part of that ongoing regular strengthening of, of uh, economic statistics in, in, in Kenya. Um, overall, in, in, in getting to your, your question on, on, on what to expect, I, I, I think it's fair to say that the, the statistical systems in, in Kenya have advanced uh, over the years. Um, and as such, this is likely to be more of an incremental improvement, uh, not likely to result in, in uh, similar large changes as, as we've seen uh, on, on some previous occasions when the exercise also included uh, a significant expansion in, in, in the coverage of, of what the, the national accounts uh, aim to, to measure in particular. Uh, previous exercises led to broader coverage of, of the informal sector. Um, so I, 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 I think we've come to a more stable point uh, where I, I would not expect uh, similarly large changes as, as previously. In, in, in terms of, of uh, individual sectors and and, and, and uh, and, and developments in, in, in GDP growth. Let, 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 let's see tomorrow. Um, maybe I would just point to that we, we had estimated uh, that real GDP growth in 2020 was close to zero. So uh, soon we'll find out if, if that was right. Thank you very much. We'll find out tomorrow indeed. Um, I'll move along back to Nigeria, Hassan. I've got another question, and this is on inflation. Um, Nigeria's inflation has been stubbornly high in the double digits uh, for 66 months now, something uh, you mentioned um, when you're providing your overview. Um, we've seen uh, um, inflation moderate over the past couple of months, um, and my question to you is, do you think it has peaked? Um, I also wanted your view on why you think inflation has been sticky in the teens region and when does the central bank think we'll see single digit inflation again in Nigeria? Hassan, you're still on mute. Sorry, sorry, sorry. thank you. Uh, in the composition of our CPI, food, the component of it is taking close to 50, uh, rather above 50 percent. 
Um, so you see food inflation playing a big part of that. There's important inflation to what is that, that is getting uh, uh, smaller and smaller by the day. But the core inflation side, which uh, include uh, PMS prices, prices of petroleum product at home, electricity and other uh, sectors of the economy are also contributing to a big part of that. The food side of it has uh, been sticky. Uh, supply side has been the supply side rigidity has been on due to the structural issues that are, was, as I mentioned, that was compounded by the, the crisis, uh, the rural headsmen and other banditry crisis that has been going on for a few years now in the country. Prior to that, we had the Al Qaeda and all the stuff that are also affecting, particularly the northeast region of the country, which is the highest uh, agricultural producing areas of the economy. So you see that supply side shrinking, shrinking substantially. The issues around uh, demand side, disposable income, as unemployment and all the stuffs were building, were building up, and poverty was also increasing. So you see both cost push uh, from supply rigidity and you know demand push from other incentives that were coming into the economy. So largely, we still claim that there's a debate around whether our inflation number is a monetary phenomenon or, stru or, or structural phenomenon. The central bank still holds that this is a structural phenomenon, but I, I won't deny there are other you know, analysts that have said that um, monetary activities are also foiling that. We don't dis 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 disagree with that 100%, but real, uh, the real thing is still around this structural uh, issues that you have around the supply, even uh, with other uh, commodities in the manufacturing sectors and soft capacity utilization is still uh, very low because investments in, in capital and uh, fixed capital and other machineries is still uh, below expectation. Financing deficit are there and we're doing measures to also attract both private and foreign uh, capital inflows to address that. So we see that applying to the numbers you see in terms of our month-to-month -month inflation number, the headline inflation. And that's why also, since the primary mandate of the central bank is price stability, we've moved to unconventional monetary policy tools to address those supply side uh, problems, including interventions in agriculture, where something we call anchor borrowers program that gives funds to rural agricultural farmers, to produce, these are not just cash, including you know, improving the seedlings or the yields of the farm, that is productivity, and it's, an, it's through the entire value chain of the agricultural sector. So we see interventions going on there substantially to you know, offset that supply uh, side uh, problem that we have. And if that crystallizes, as we are seeing the numbers now, largely the GDP numbers I mentioned for 5.01 at Q2 2021, it's largely driven by the agricultural manufacturing, then you have the services uh, uh, sector. So that supply side issues, I can say substantially, is accounting for this sticky downward uh, trend of, uh, of our inflation uh, numbers. But uh, for now, I think we've reached the peak and the downward trend, because before this tickling downwards that we have, we had inflation month to month growing for close to 19 months. You know, every other month you have some decimal increase in inflation but three consecutive months now month of months and we have seen decline in inflation numbers we, we believe that the interventions are already yielding fruit and there's a life period for that to crystallize substantially into the economy but in the next one or two years we should expect that to impact significantly in terms of agricultural private sector investments in the agricultural sector which is the main supplier of the food and then you see the services and other sectors, manufacturing, industrial output growth, also impacting the supply base. You see the numbers or uh, inflation numbers going down. Yvonne. Thank you. For, thank you very much, Hassan. It was uh, very interesting to hear um, you explain um, um, the central bank's view um, on the drives of inflation being structural and how that links to some of the measures um, that have been taken um, on the farming side. Something that some might consider outside of the central bank, but. Um, it's, it's good to hear your reasoning, uh, the central bank's reasoning on why um, Nigeria has opted to go in that direction. Um, I guess time will tell us whether it is becoming effective. Thank you for that. Um, my next question I'll address to Tobias, and it's related to um, 
two sectors, manufacturing as well as exports. So this is often a question we get from investors and uh, observing what's happening in the manufacturing sector. So firstly, manufacturing, which is, you know, is the second biggest economic sector in Kenya after agriculture, has tended to exhibit weak growth over the years. It's certainly been weaker um, than GDP growth. And I'm interested in to hear what you attribute that to. My second, the second part of that question, um, and I'll tell you why I think they're related. Secondly, we've also noted export to GDP ratio falling for the past several years, from around 14% in a decade ago in 2011 to 6% in 2020. I know 2020 was a really poor year, but it wasn't much higher in 2019. I'm keen to hear what you think the reasons are behind this, and if you think the shilling could be a contributory factor. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the questions in relation to Kenya's manufacturing performance and, and, and uh, following that also uh, the, the export performance, is, it, it's not a straightforward one to, to answer. Um, and, and particularly because when, when you look at many of the metrics that one normally looks at uh, in, in terms of what we think important for, for private sector development, th then Kenya has actually been doing quite well. Um, for example, it, it's ranking in, in the World Bank's doing business indicators uh, improve sharply from 129 in, in 2014 to, to 56 uh, in, in the most recent survey. Um, and and I, uh, perhaps not quite as, as, as strongly, but uh, on, on many of the other indicators of, of business environment, uh, Kenya does relatively well. Um, th th there are perhaps some some questions in, in, in particular areas, um, electricity, for example, uh, prices uh, in, in Kenya are higher than in neighboring countries, uh, but they haven't been increasing. So it, it, it's, it's not obvious that really that, that explains uh, a, a weaker manufacturing performance. Um, I, I, I think part of the story has to do with the sector not having been sufficiently innovative in, in, in terms of uh, adapting to a, a, a changing environment, uh, a changing competitive environment globally uh, with more competitive pressure from China and, and uh, other countries outside the region. K Kenya used to be uh, somewhat of a manufacturing hub for the East African region, and I, I, I think in recent years uh, has has struggled to to maintain that that presence in in, in face of, of stronger uh, external competitiveness. You you, you then drew the link to uh, to export performance and I, 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 I think indeed uh, there is a link there. Um, goods exports uh, have not been performing well and and again I, I, I think um, it, it's at least to some extent due to the product mix um, with exports increasingly focused on, on uh, a few agricultural products, tea, coffee, horticulture, um, where, where Kenya is competitive. But I, I think the, the challenge is that these are not very rapidly growing markets. Uh, so, so, so Kenya has, has been doing well there, but it, it's not really a market that has been growing much. Uh, and in, in some of the, the potentially faster growing areas in manufacturing and, and, and so on, uh, the, the country hasn't really been, been keeping up, or I should say the, the, the sector hasn't really been, been keeping up. Um, and, and 
I, I, I think important to, to, to also recognize that in, in as much as, as we're talking about uh, sectoral performance, uh, the, the, the numbers you, you quoted were all for, for goods exports. I think Kenya has been doing better in, in, in services. Uh, financial services in, in, in particular. Uh, there has been a broader shift in the economy towards uh, towards the service sector. Uh, so so that, that's an area where uh, we see much more dynamism and, and, and expansion. Uh, but manufacturing indeed has, uh, has been weak. Um, in, in, in terms of exchange rate, I mean, I, I, I would simply note that uh, our most recent uh, external uh, external balance uh, ass assessment or external sector assessment uh, indicated that uh, Kenya's external position was, was in, in line with fundamentals uh, so we, we don't see uh, misalignments there uh, Kenya has uh, a flexible exchange rate regime uh, and and we have been seeing movement uh, in the exchange rate which uh, is a good thing um, and and it has a very open capital account so uh, I, I i i don't think the the problems are, are necessarily there i, I to, to me it, it it suggests more a question on on, on product mix and and perhaps lacking uh, innovation in, in, in that particular sector of, of manufacturing. Thank you very much. Um, that was very insightful. I'll move back to uh, Nigeria, Hassan. Um, first, uh, just to finish off the inflation discussion, um, I wanted to hear your views on the interest rate trajectory from here on out. Um, I know in 2020, the um, um, one policy committee cut the policy rate by two percentage points, 11.5%, and that was their way of providing an accommodated environment to shore up growth. Um, we are seeing growth pick up. Um, inflation, as you mentioned, has started to moderate. What indicators do you need going forward um, to give you comfort to return to more orthodox monetary policy? And um, I, in case we differ in terms of opinion and what I mean by that, basically, do we expect to see more tightening? Because at this um, levels, inflation is higher than the policy rate. Um, thank you. That's always this dilemma for monetary policy uh, committee members in terms of whether to tame the inflation or to drive growth. And sometimes you see some contra a uh, cross uh, uh, restriction between those uh, objectives and there's a need to balance where do you want to go. Um, during the crisis, uh, you know, generally monetary policy tools have their potency level weakened substantially, particularly given the kind of economic structures that uh, we operate in. But the adjustment uh, by the central bank, uh, the monetary policy rate by the 100 basis points that brought it to 11.5% um, was just at the beginning of the of the crisis of the COVID uh, pandemic to you know enable banks now to extend uh, a credit to the rest of the economy. We also have what you call uh, the LDR, you know, uh, which which is gives the volume of about 65% of the total uh, funding um, position of the banks to be lent out to the rest of the economy because we see that credit conundrum within the economy and that was a regulatory requirement uh, a prudential requirement for banks to meet to extend credit uh, to the economy however we, we could also you know theoretically talk about the transmission mechanism of monetary policy to domestic prices including the lending rates in the banks and the savings rates and other rates including the the fx rate um, that transmission is it's also an issue that we consider in terms of how we use monetary policy, policy tools, and that also informs the um, orthodox uh, monetary policy instruments that are, that are being used to, to, drive, to drive that. 
Um, generally, what is important for, for, for financial institutions is the risk profile of the economy in the sense that um, they're able to recoup some of their assets that were created in terms of uh, not getting their uh, MPL numbers high. But there's also a regulatory threshold for that. So you see that um, uh, coming up in, in the behavior of banks too, in terms of which sectors they, they invest in. The sectors that are supposed to drive employment creation and drive growth faster, the real sectors, are the sectors that are less lucrative for the banks. Agriculture and other sectors that you see um, will be impacting more on the economy than you know exchange rate I mean uh, foreign exchange issues around that and other services that are not connected to uh, the labor intensive potentials uh, of the economy so for directory of monetary policy or the direction of monetary policy when we see a sustainable growth in the GDP numbers and, the, and that sustainable growth in GDP number will also include that the GDP growth is inclusive, uh, productivity is also increasing, uh, capitalization is also increasing. Then you see that translating to uh, employment creation, well-being of the rest of the economy. Then you start seeing, you know, central bank now, you know, adjusting way to tighten. But for now, if you tighten, you want to create credit to the rest of the economy from the private sector. The tighten rate goes up you're also you know defeating your objective at the other end so that balancing act is required at all time to be able to you know face monetary policy price stability your primary mandate and also you know consolidating on this growth recovery that we are seeing uh, more or less post uh, the pandemic now going forward um, so i think that is still an issue and then simultaneously we are still uh, we're still dealing with that uh, dilemma um, the monetary policy framework is monetary targeting so it's the quantity of money in the economy that we use to moderate prices but when you see those frictions like i told you about within the market system then you start you require some you know administrative tools to address some of this uh, thing Indeed, those are supposed to be trans transitory and temporary tools so that the bank concentrates on its core mandate in terms of using monetary policy tools to drive the actualization of its own uh, objects, policy objectives. Thank you. So we've got about 11 minutes left, so I'm going to put in a couple of more questions in before we conclude. And um, Tobias, I think we should address the fiscal side. Um, I think which is probably one of the biggest challenges in the Kenyan economy. Uh, we noted in April that the AMF board approved the $2.34 uh, billion um, ECF and EFF arrangement for Kenya, and it's intended to help Kenya reduce its debt vulnerabilities, which you mentioned earlier, through a multi-year fiscal uh, consolidation plan that is centered around raising tax revenues and tightly controlling spending. We noted at the time, uh, those of us who follow the Kenyan media, that some Kenyans were unhappy with the IMF providing a loan to a government that they felt was already over indebted. Uh, public debt is sitting at over 70% of uh, GDP. Um, and uh, they were concerned about that funding also being mismanaged and previous product, uh, projects um, were cited. My question to you is what, was, what is the IMF's response to those concerns? Yeah. So, so, so those reactions that you you mentioned this was something we saw um, especially uh, on, on social media and, and especially uh, in the days surrounding the the approval uh, of the program by the IMF board in, in early April um, it, it was getting a lot of play mainly in in, in the few days between the the board meeting um, and before the the staff report was was published uh, so, so before people really had a chance to to see what the program was was about um, so i i would note that uh, the concerns that were being expressed uh, in 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 those days uh, about government debt uh, and about governance are in fact central to 
to the IMF uh, supported program. Um, reducing debt vulnerabilities through a multi year fiscal consolidation uh, is really the, the key objective of, of, of the program. Um, the program also includes important measures to promote greater transparency in, in public accounts uh, yeah. and, and to strengthen the anti-corruption framework uh, generally. So, I mean, what, what I, I would say is that uh, the concerns uh, that, that people have are, are, are not at odds at all with the program, uh, quite to the, to the contrary. And I think that also became uh, evident to people once they had a chance to to read the the program documents. Uh, so th these expressions of of, of concern um, seem to have have faded away. Um, but 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 le let me also just say a, a, a few words then on 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 the fiscal performance so far. Uh, I, I had mentioned in, in my, my opening remarks that uh, the outturn we, we saw for the most recent fiscal year uh, was encouraging. Um, the, the budget had provided for an increase in, in the deficit uh, in response to, to the, the COVID shock. Uh, and, and in recognition of, of the impact on, on revenue uh, and added spending requirements that, that came with the shock. Um, but that the deficit target was then met in, in, in light of those circumstances and, and uh, the deficit target was for a, a quite modest widening of, of, of the deficit, that this target was met, what was exceeded, I, I, I think, was a important accomplishment um, and, and particularly encouraging to see that uh, revenue performed well in, in line with, with target, reflecting a, a sharp improvement uh, during the second half of, of, of the fiscal year. This comes against a, a, a backdrop of revenue having underperformed uh, in, in the previous several budgets. Uh, so so a, a quite important uh, change there. Um, with, with the program, uh, this is, is, is a three-year program. Uh, we're now uh, looking to see significant reductions of, of, of the deficit over the next a uh, couple of years. Um, it, it, it's been an encouraging start, uh, I, I would say, but obviously also uh, there is a way to go yet. Thank you. Thank you. I do agree. It is encouraging to see the revenue pick up uh, because um, they've uh, um, for several years uh, failed to meet their revenue target. So that is um, encouraging. Um, my next question um, is to you, Hassan, and uh, this is uh, from our bank's analyst, uh, who uh, will be impressed with me if I didn't put this forward. It's regarding, uh, it's a bank's related question, so it's regarding the special bill. Um, the various parts to it, but basically his questions are around the volume, so basically what percentage of the CRRs were converted to special bills, what the interest rates would be, um, and what happens at maturity as well as um, liquidity if they're being traded by banks and implications of the low rates on the bank's returns. If you can address any of those, that will be appreciated. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I, you know, I mentioned earlier about uh, the monetary policy framework and that our, our operational target is the monetary aggregate and the volume of money within the economy. We see over the years, uh, some level of liquidity within the banking system, which is not on related with uh, some of the uh, avenues of uh, or the risks attached to extending credit to some sectors of the economy. And I also mentioned uh, around the LDR loan to deposit ratio, which was increased to enable banks to lend to the rest of the economy. Because what you generally find is those idle funds 
if they don't go into the real sector of the economy to drive growth, they go to attack the exchange rates in terms of demands or investments, or they go to uh, investments in treasury bills, which is more or less like government financing of government, which crowds out the private sector. So the, the special bills was created to take some of this excess liquidity out, 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 out of the system because there's an extent to which we can go in terms of increasing the CRM uh, in the sense that we, we tighten the bank from both uh, ends. You asking LGR to increase and then you also tighten the CRR end. So the, the special bills is, is uh, in terms of the volume now, it's just a, a little less than a 5 trillion uh, Naira. And then the rate at which that operate is supposed to 0.5%. 0, 0 it can be traded within banks at in the bank in, at the interbank um, segment of the market where the banks can use that to uh, manage their the liquidities within the within the within the system within the interbank uh, system it is not supposed to come back to the central bank to be discounted for for, for cash or, or whatever because uh, except if you we have also a five percent uh, window where you can take from your CR to you know extend credit to some real sector or priority sectors of the economy you have access to that you can come at any time to take it however if you don't have anything to do with those funds outside there then you just hold it here for for us to be able to achieve our monetary policy objective so around the special bills that is just um, principally what it is um, it is, um, is supposed to serve uh, you also have the omo which you are very much aware of and how along the line we come to have uh, foreign investors in OMO and that was also going to be impacting on uh, our FX numbers. Originally OMO is supposed to be transaction between the banks and the central bank but um, we also use depositors funds to do that so at the end of the day we come to see that um, that signal coming out on which we needed to, to manage in, in terms of uh, the supply side issues that I mentioned around FX so that when there's a rush for those uh, OMO foreign holdings of OMO to go out, it will impact on our system. So there was a systematic um, uh, work on that in terms of how we manage that, not to bring too much uh, distortion into the into into the market. So for for the special bills, I think that is just uh, uh, the purpose it, it is meant for. It, it is it is uh, it's a very successful. A tool used by the bank in the sense that uh, we're able to, you know, have some sanity within the within the within the system, and that has also helped the money market rates. You can see that the treasury bills and the OBB rates that went down to close to zero during the peak of the crisis are all picking up now, and that is also translating to the fixed income and uh, the equities market. So you see the market uh, reviving uh, substantially, and those are also you know, rates that we look at in terms of uh, uh, seeing the responsiveness of our MP, uh, our monetary policy rates to other money market rates. Thank you very much. Um, we've come to the end of our session. Um, and I just want to invite each panelist, if you have a couple of words you want to say in closing, you're welcome to. Um, um, Hassan, I know you've got a flight to catch, so. Uh, your time constraint, but if you wanted to mention the digital currency uh, um, in, in this uh, short window of time, this is your opportunity to do so. So I'll invite you to say something there. Yes, the Central Bank of Nigeria is also in that uh, space now, like other many other central banks in the world. Uh, we have issues around cryptocurrencies and how that was penetrated into our banking system and systemic risk uh, coming up, and we had some measures to curtail that. Uh, the central bank is, is launching its own digital currency. It's going to go live by the October 1st this year. Principal objectives of that, apart from addressing monetary policy issues, apart from addressing payment system effectiveness in terms of cost of uh, transactions and the speed of transaction and efficiency of transactions and cross-border issues, it's also a major tool that we we'll use to penetrate our financial inclusion objectives, including uh the, the the government using that as a channel to you know get uh, transfers uh, phone transfers to the rest of the economy in a transparent manner in a monitor monitorable uh, process at, at, at least cost 
also expect that also attract uh, remittances uh, since cost of remittances to Nigeria is high. So we have a lot of buckets. It's supposed to be uh, a kind of uh, two-step uh, retail approach that we are going to be adopting for the digital currency, which we are going to be calling e naira, and then you can do P to P, P to P, merchant to P. You know all the buckets that um, are all are all available in that um, in that space, but principally. Uh, to make uh, transfers and settlement extremely fast and soft and costs effective for, 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 the, for the economy. Let me not delay my own flight. Yes, Thank you very much. Uh, Tobias, do you have any closing comments? Well, maybe, maybe just to, uh, to point to, uh, given that we were talking about uh, digitalization and, and, and those issues there, the, the mobile money experience in, in, in Kenya, I think, has been uh, quite instructive. Uh, so government took uh, the initiative to, 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 to try to really push uh, mobile money usage where, where Kenya was already a, a leader pre-COVID, but to advance that during the pandemic uh, for health reasons, to avoid uh, physical transactions, but also uh, really to, to stimulate that area. And, and some of the results have been quite remarkable. Uh, Mobile money transactions have uh, almost doubled uh, compared to, to pre-COVID with, with transaction volume of uh, over 5 billion a month in, in, in recent months. So I, I, I think something encouraging to, to point to there. Indeed. And maybe I take an opportunity to mention uh, that we're having a Nigeria FinTech Day on Thursday. So the old uh, FinTech talk on that particular day being hosted by our banks and FinTech and the Sojvi Solanke. So if you have time, please join us. And just to conclude, I don't want Dr. Mahmoud to uh, miss his flight. I would like to thank you both for being so generous with your time. This has been highly engaging and insightful, and I hope to do this again, hopefully in person, next year again. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you. Knowledge is information, but not all information turns into knowledge. Today, every company leaves digital footprints in hundreds of different sources. But this information by itself does not tell you who it is you're looking at and what the risks of doing business with them are. Businesses can't exist in a vacuum. They need employees, customers, partners, contractors, investors. Good counter-agents help a company succeed, create products, make profit, expand business opportunities. But what about bad ones? 
49% of organizations around the world say that they've been victims of fraud or economic crime. Two-thirds of Russian companies say they've encountered economic crime in the past two years. This is significantly higher than the global average. Every year, 15% of companies simply disappear, whether on their own initiative or because they're forced to do so by tax bodies often leaving unpaid debts. If you want to minimize your risk, you need to find and analyze every scrap of information you can. Identifying, analyzing, collecting facts. Processing big data is impossible without qualified specialists, experience, time, expensive equipment, new technology, machine learning, graphs. Spark Interfax gathers information from all available sources and converts it into knowledge, allowing you to see the world of business in its entirety with all its risks and opportunities. And there's no doubt that tomorrow we'll be able to understand the world of business even better thanks to the emerging digital economy, cutting-edge technology and the availability of new information about the lives of companies. Knowledge decreases risks and creates trust. The foundation of any successful business. Knowledge is information, but not all information turns into knowledge. Today, every company leaves digital footprints in hundreds of different sources. But this information by itself does not tell you who it is you're looking at and what the risks of doing business with them are. Businesses can't exist in a vacuum. They need employees, customers, partners, contractors, investors. Good counter-agents help a company succeed, create products, make profit, expand business opportunities. But what about bad ones? 49% of organizations around the world say that they've been victims of fraud or economic crime. Two-thirds of Russian companies say they've encountered economic crime in the past two years. This is significantly higher than the global average. Every year, 15% of companies simply disappear, whether on their own initiative or because they're forced to do so by tax bodies often leaving unpaid debts. If you want to minimize your risk, you need to find and analyze every scrap of information you can, identifying, analyzing, collecting facts. Processing big data is impossible without qualified specialists, experience, time, expensive equipment, new technology, machine learning, graphs. Spark Interfax 
gathers information from all available sources and converts it into knowledge, allowing you to see the world of business in its entirety with all its risks and opportunities. And there's no doubt that tomorrow we'll be able to understand the world of business even better thanks to the emerging digital economy, cutting-edge technology and the availability of new information about the lives of companies. Knowledge decreases risks and creates trust. The foundation of any successful business.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to our Nigeria and West Africa oil and gas outlook panel. I'm Nick Stefano, Rent Caps Africa oil and gas analyst, and joining me today are Mrs. Egesan, Group General Manager for Corporate Planning and Strategy of Nigeria National Petroleum Corporation, Neil Shah, Cosmos Energy CFO, and Emeka Onwuka, Seplatz Energy CFO. Thank you all for your participation today. The past year and a half has been a turbulent period for the oil markets. And although oil prices have recovered materially in recent months, the energy transition is a theme that is here to stay. For many countries in Africa, in particular Nigeria, which has recently made some major changes to its hydrocarbon legislation, oil and gas is a material source of revenue. And today we'll try to address some stakeholder questions about Nigeria's and West Africa's oil and gas outlook. Mr. Seya, may I some, I think, should uh, start with you. I'd like to congratulate you and the Nigerian government for passing the petroleum industry bill into law. It looks like the amended version of the bill contains um, improved fiscal terms relative to the original draft that was sent to the chambers last year. And I was wondering if you could explain to us what was the feedback from, from the upstream sector? And uh, do you think that uh, now that the bill has become law, investment in Nigeria's oil sector will be invigorated? Yeah. Thank you very much. Indeed, <laughs> the PIA is a major win for the Nigerian economy, uh, specifically for the oil and gas industry. Um, the bill, like you all know, um, has been under review for over two decades now. And um, seeing us to the end of that journey um, was a major win for all stakeholders. Um, at the time, like you said, the bill was uh, presented to the National Assembly uh, last year and the ensuing um, public hearings uh, that followed at the National Assembly. Uh, the National Assembly gave assurances that they will engage all stakeholders to address uh, concerns uh, because the major objective was to enact a bill that was competitive, you know, that offered Nigeria a competitive edge in the oil and gas uh, space. So um, engagements um, occurred, you know, after the presentation of the bill. And I think the final outcome is what we consider a win-win for all stakeholders. So I think uh, the National Assembly uh, working with their consultants uh, benchmark what was presented. And um, after very, very interactive consultations with the major industry players, um, we all agreed and came to um, the final draft that we have today passed uh, as law. Now, what does that portend for Nigeria? We think this is, we believe that this is a major win for the uh, Nigerian oil and gas industry. Um, over the last couple of years, we have seen a dirt in uh, investment uh, in the industry. And that was really as a result of um, unclear fiscal terms, you know, for uh, major participants. And uh, because of that um, lack of clarity, uh, most IOCs um, preferred to divert their investment capital elsewhere. Today, we have a bill that I believe competes favorably with um, other clients. And therefore we believe that we will see uh, an attraction of investment in the oil and gas space. Thank you so much for, uh, for your answering explanations. Now, Mika, the next question is, is for you. Uh, Asan, as Sepla, you know, it's an oil and, oil and gas company in Nigeria. How does the PIB, in your and, and Sepla's view, uh, affect Sepla and the broader Nigerian oil and gas sector? And do you, do you see any specific uh, opportunities for investor? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nick. I'll, I'll just start by echoing uh, what uh, Mr. Yusuf talked about. The longer awaited bill um, has been passed. And the industry is quite excited because it provides a lot of clarity and certainty in that of the direction of the industry and definitely will enhance confidence uh, in the industry. 
uh, the global transition, uh, uh, global energy transition uh, data space, most of the IOCs and the players in the industry will continue to evaluate the completeness of the, the physical regime they see from one territory to the other. And the physical regime we are seeing in the PIL, you know, it compete favorably, like uh, Mr. Yan talked about. And we believe that this will enhance confidence and uh, attract more investments into the, into the sector. Particularly for projects that previously have been deferred, uh, projects that were still on the drawing table because of the uncertainties around the fiscal regime, we believe that those projects currently will be undertaken by the, by the IOCs and also by the indigenous companies as well, because um, the, the, the whole, um, the, the significant changes you see in it's a transformative for the industry in terms of uh, consideration. Now, uh, two major areas as well we need to highlight, apart from the governance and the regulations that, that have changed for the better. Uh, the fund that they established for the midstream and the downstream gas uh, business uh, will play a very big role in improving infrastructure to help, uh, uh, to help uh, make the gas industry attractive in terms of uh, more extraction of, uh, of gas. And you also know the issues we have of the communities and um, the fact that uh, the oil companies have to have a good relationship with their communities. The new re requirement of a 3% fund in terms of uh, spend for community uh, engagement is you know, also very welcome. You know, we are separate and pride ourselves the fact that we work very closely with the communities and have over the years in you know, a very good relation. This will enhance, uh, this enhance that relation in terms of um, the funding that required for that uh, sector. So believe there are great opportunities ahead for oil and gas business in Nigeria. That's uh, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. So, 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 so in a nutshell, uh, for, one of the things you said is that um, the the new improved fiscal terms will make a lot of these projects that have not um, you know yet been sanctioned even more competitive. And you do see them, you know, uh, been developing you know further, uh, getting the go ahead, the green light um, in the future. Um, Mrs. Sayesan, um, back to you. So. The bill will convert uh, NNPC to a limited liability company and, uh, and JVs could become a um, so-called incorporate JVs. Now, I presume a reason for this plan was to make financing easier for you know, NNPC and, and those JVs. And, um, and, and Mr. Kiar yesterday, the, the managing director of, uh, of NNPC um, said on a Bloomberg interview that the company could do an IPO as early as 2024. Could you Please go over the plan for NNPC and, and, and its future direction. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so indeed, um, the transition uh, program for NNPC has somewhat been captured in the PIA. Uh, six months um, after the enactment of the act, uh, NNPC will be a fully-fledged karma entity. Um, thereafter, 18 months thereafter, um, the separation of the NNPC Limited uh, and NNPC would have occurred with assets transferred, um, assets that NNPC um, isn't willing to progress with transferred or retained within NNPC Corporation. Uh, and that corporation will be wound down by the Minister of Finance and the Minister of the Petroleum Resources. Um, it will interest you to note that um, in the last two years, NNPC has actually been working towards a commercially viable uh, entity. Um, we have as a mantra, the tape agenda, which um, um, basically says uh, that we will be more transparent, accountable, and we will strive for performance excellence. In the last two years, we have really worked towards attaining that. And a testament to that is um, the uh, results of our 2020 audited accounts. So um, it's, it's reassuring that the bill recognizes that we will be going into that state and we had already, we've already jump-started that even before um, the enactment of the of the bill. So NNPC will metamorphose into a karma entity, like I said, and we will strengthen the commercial status that NNPC currently has obtained, and ensure that it is a fully fully uh, a profitable venture company, uh, and, and, and its and its subsidiaries are also run um, as such. 
The bill also recognizes that the current joint venture um, organizations that we have, the current joint venture businesses that we have, um, are at liberty to transmute into incorporated joint ventures. This will be, it will be a mandatory uh, requirement. It will be a voluntary requirement. And I believe that for every entity, uh, that will be the ultimate goal because like you rightly said, uh, you know, in, in, in leading to this um, discourse, that it will be a, a basis to access financing. And we know that for oil and gas business, that is a key requirement. So I think it will be in our best and uh, best interest, you know, to um, transmute these companies, our unincorporated joint ventures, to incorporated joint ventures as soon as possible. So the timeline is ongoing, and um, uh, in terms of the IPO, I, I believe the B, the bill says that um, three years after the enactment that the NNPC will be um, able to open its shares up to the public, you know, and I think we will walk towards that, you know, as we, as we progress. Thank you for this. And, um, and, and that's a follow-up. The, the, the rationale behind the, the listing of NNPC, is it, um, is it in, to enhance the local Nigerian stock markets or is it to give an opportunity to, to Nigerians to invest in this company themselves? I think it's a mix of all. Fair enough, fair enough. It's a, it's a good answer. Um, Neil, let's, um, let's talk a bit uh, about, uh, since we're on this financing topic, I'd like to ask you, if you have seen a change in, uh, in, the, in the oil financing uh, and reserve-based lending uh, appetite since uh, the pandemic's outbreak, in other words, are banks concerned about um, ESG or increasing credit risk, and um, of, you know, with the, with the MPs, and do you think that debt capital markets could actually be more prevalent than reserve-based lending facilities in the future? Uh, thanks, Nick, and, and good afternoon to everyone uh, on the call. Um, it's a good question because I think you know, there has been a lot of change in the market. Um, yeah, but I think on the whole, you know, core banks and investors continue. To remain sort of committed to the space and commit uh, committed to bank and bond transactions. You know, as you know, we've been active uh, this year. Um, you know, with our RBL extension, our senior notes offering, and um, with BP's recent capital raising for the FPSO uh, sale and leaseback uh, transaction in Mauritania, Senegal. So, seen quite a bit of uh, transactional activity um, this year. There are changes in the credit markets. Um, and they are happening as both you know, banks and investors uh, and companies evaluate how they um, modify or tr modify their portfolios to take into account sort of ESG and the energy transition into their own strategies. And so I don't think it's as much around sort of the bank market versus uh, the bond market or credit investors. I think both are becoming more vocal and requiring companies to support um, their ESG agendas that are aligned with you know, the, their financial institutions and how they want um, to deploy capital. Um, you know, for Cosmos, we, you know, we've been welcoming um, this approach and have uh, had positive discussions with our banks for, for quite some time um, over the topic is um, you know, we would like to be at the forefront of the issue. Um, you know, we have a portfolio and a strategy that's well aligned with the direction in which the banks and investors um, want to go. And that's why I think, you know, we've continued to see support. Um, you know, our growing gas portfolio largely and in, in with the TOR2 LNG project is set to become sort of a major part of our production portfolio in um, 2023 beyond. And, you know, as you know, gas is seen as a major uh, partner to renewables through the energy transition. And so having a large exposure to, to growing gas and LNG is a positive. Um, we're also investing in low cost, uh, low carbon oil. Um, you know, we have infrastructure led opportunities within Equatorial Guinea, the Gulf of Mexico, um, which can provide sort of shorter cycle, low cost uh, oil with significantly less emissions um, than, than new greenfield projects. So we can provide the world the, oil, the, world, the oil it needs in the short term. 
Um, and then lastly, you know, we have a 2030 uh, scope one and scope two uh, net zero emissions target uh, with a measure, mitigate, and reduce strategy for emissions. Um, and we're investing in nature-based carbon capture solutions to offset any other emissions that we can't uh, mitigate. And so, you know, I think we're doing the right things across the portfolio to continue to get that support. Um, and you know, that's gonna be critical to ensure financing access in the future. Um, there is probably a bit less appetite from some of the smaller fringe banks who are still assessing how core the oil and gas market is to their portfolios. Um, but I think for good companies with the right um, ESG agenda, uh, financing will continue to be there in both the bank and the bond markets. So thanks for thanks for this comprehensive answer. And um, it was also quite uh, interesting to know that um, I think um, you had some ESG sort of like uh, KPIs linked to, to your interest. That's fairly unique, I think. You know, from any any company in the, the oil and gas space, I've seen to do you maybe briefly touch on that. Uh, you know, you want yeah, no, we, we've had a uh, happy to Nick. Uh, we had a long conversation with our banks around. You know, we, we think it's important um, that we continually continuously improve along our emissions trajectory. So it's not just sort of putting a target, but that there needs to be hard goals set aside, uh, set alongside uh, those uh, ambitions, and so. Um, you know, we did build that in um, into our uh, RBL facility. We, I believe it is the first sort of West African RBL to have sort of ESG KPIs built into it, but it provides some, us some economic incentive along with, um, you know, to, to demonstrate continued uh, improvement on that path to lower emissions. And for them, um, you know, for the banking market in total, I think it, it helps demonstrate to their sort of credit committees that yeah you know, they are investing in com you know in a company or supporting a company uh, who's doing the right things along with you know where they want to go and so it's a win win i think from from that perspective and again i, I think this is an, an issue where we feel you know importantly that we're sort of doing the right things and we may be at the forefront of it but i think yeah it's very much the the direction uh, the industry needs to go in Thanks for this, Neil. I've got some more ESG questions uh, coming up later. But for now, let's move back to Nigeria. Mrs. Ayesan, the government has declared this decade uh, as, as a decade of gas. But um, if we look at some of the um, reported numbers, uh, and in general, it looks like in the past few years, the domestic gas landscape has changed uh, very little. So do you need to explain me you know what the government's targets are for for domestic gas in nigeria and, and how they're going to be implemented thank you very much um, I, i'm surprised you from your paradigm you see very little changes uh from where i sit i see substantial changes um 2020 uh, 2005 uh, we were barely doing 300 million costs of gas domestically uh, today, uh, we are doing close to two uh, billion scoffs, and I think that's a substantial improvement. And what has supported that growth? It's basically the commitment of government over the years. You know, in, in 2017, uh, the gas master plan policy uh, was approved by the uh, Federal Executive Council. And since then, uh, the Minister of State, the Minister, the NNPC, and um, active stakeholders in the gas space have been working, you know, around the clock to ensure that we deepen and expand the gas footprint within the country. So, I mean, most of the issues that, that really held the gas sector down, I believe uh, have been addressed. Are uh, being addressed, and um, the decade of gas is to ensure that we really push that envelope, you know, to to the to the greatest heights that we can get to. In the next, by 2025, we we hope to increase our current uh, domestic gas utilization to about 4.5 BCF, and that is not just on the drawing board. Uh, the um, current um, infrastructure projects that we are doing is to support that aspiration. The AKK uh, project, um, 
which was launched at the height of the pandemic, is a testament that this government is putting its, its, uh, its money where it needs to. You know, over the years, indeed, we, we have paid lip service to uh, the gas hole revolution. But now the government is committed to funding and implementing critical infrastructure projects. Apart from the projects themselves, gas price, appropriate pricing. You know, over the, over the last year, um, industry stakeholders worked together to ensure that at least we all agree on gas pricing that will support, you know, investment in, in the space. And um, a few weeks ago, the minister also announced um, gas to power, uh, a reduced gas to power pricing. So all these are things that the government is doing. And we know that um, uh, our stakeholders like CEPLAT is uh, increasing as well uh, their gas footprint to ensure that we, we expand the domestic gas space. And it's not just in the domestic gas space, even for export. Um, at the height of the pandemic as well, we took uh, concluded FID for trade seven of the NLNG, you know, to increase the NLNG capacity. And I think these are uh, very, very clear um, strides, you know, that this government and the, the active stakeholders are all working towards achieving. And this also ties on with uh, aspirations to decarbonize as well, because even as we use um, gas as a transition fuel, we are also working towards seeing efficiencies, you know, in our utilization of gas as we go down that path. Thank you so much for the <laughs> So, so uh, the, 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 if, if I should take them, the government's target for domestic gas is 4.5 BCF per day um, in 2025 from two uh, now. That, from, that's yes, from about what? Yes, almost two. Okay, thank you so much for this. Um, Neil, let's go back to, to you and, uh, and talk a bit about uh, m and um, You guys have been... Um, active in several countries in, uh, in Africa and also quite active inorganically uh, in, in the past. And, and, and we're seeing a trend in recent years where smaller players are trying to take advantage of the exit of the larger companies from, from some assets. And, uh, and the private equity market is also you know, quite, um, quite hot there as well. What are your thoughts about the African M&A uh, space and uh, are the prices where you would expect them to be? No, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question, Nick. Uh, and yeah, I think yeah, Cosmos has been active in the M and A market and uh, has been yeah has a quite a good track record. Where, you know where we've targeted assets that fit well uh, into our existing portfolio, and where Cosmos has a you know unique opportunity to add value um, in places where you know we're very aligned with the governments, which know that you know Cosmos is looking to invest and grow, uh, not just produce. Um, you know, the EG acquisition from Hess in 2017 is a good example of that, uh, of a transaction that makes, you know, quite a, a lot of sense financially with payback, you know, in less than a year, but also brought an asset base that has a significant amount of future upside uh, potential in the right hands. Um, we are seeing more opportunities like that uh, in the market today uh, as majors and large independents uh, reshuffle their portfolios, both in, in, in West Africa and uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, yeah, there are lots of sellers, um, yeah, but um, only a handful of credible buyers who have the track record in Africa, the right relationships uh, and above ground expertise to get um, you know, difficult transactions done. Um, we're also seeing a pullback from some of the PE players who have been active in the, in, in the recent past, um, which also reduces the likely buyer pool as the equity financing you know, that has been there in the past becomes more difficult. Um, and so, again, I think it's sort of a knock-on effect as companies and investors you know, manage their, through this sort of ESG transition. Um, but that combination of a few buyers uh, and lots of sellers means you know, you know, we believe we can buy assets at attractive prices today. Um, in terms of valuation, I think you know, we think assets will trade below sort of their 1P PB10 uh, valuations based at reasonable oil prices. 
um, where we think you know the new buyers can have access to significant upside through both sort of realizing the 2P potential um, resource base as well as through price. Um, and so there's a lot of potential for value creation and appreciation um, yeah, that we'll uh, continue to evaluate. But it is a, an evolving market um, and one where there looks to be currently a dislocation. It's a, it's a really interesting, Neil, um, especially on the comment on the on the 1P kind of like valuations you're seeing out there. So maybe it's probably we should be expecting a bit more activity from, from all these uh, African players in the near future. Mr. Sison, let's go back to Nigeria now. Um, now, Shell recently announced that um, it intends to exit uh, onshore and shallow um, water in Nigeria. Mm-hmm. And um, although NSPDC has been, uh, you know, reducing its footprint for, for quite some time, and actually SEPLA was created out of those, uh, of those uh, Shell assets, it is still a critical player for, for onshore Nigeria. And um, a lot of well, some stakeholders at least are a bit worried that, uh, you know, the exit of such a big player like Shell might be a bit disruptive, at least maybe in the short term, for, um, for the sector. How, how do you plan on managing this? You're on mute. Yes, indeed, the news of Shell's uh, divestment uh, came as a surprise to us because um, in the course of um, discussing the, the PIB, um, one of the, con- I mean, they raised several concerns and um, we, we thought most of their concerns were addressed in the final bill and um, hearing their um, decision to still divest was, was quite a bit of a, 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 a surprise to us. But having said that, uh, we, we see in every, in every disappointment, we see opportunities you know, emerging. So for, for the um, local space, uh, we, we believe that um, the Nigerian oil and gas industry has matured to such a point that, yes, we can grow um, more internal capabilities and resources to run the oil and gas business. So in as much as it, it will be like you put it it may be destructive. I'm not saying for a certainty. It may be destructive in the short term. I believe we are all geared for um, taking up the challenge very quickly and running with it. Uh, um, Nigeria is hopeful that uh, we will get back to, you know, with, especially with the um, very generous terms of the PIA, uh, we, we are sure we can fill the void very quickly and, and um, walk the oil and gas space appropriately, especially the onshore, the onshore space. Thank you so much for this, uh, Mr. Yassam. Uh, Emeka, um, with this uh, Shell announcement, um, how do you see the m and space in Nigeria? And, and do you think there are opportunities for uh, indigenous players there? Uh, certainly, I think uh, the m space in oil and gas in Nigeria is beginning to get um, um, exciting uh, with the IOCs retreating from uh, onshore and, sw- and uh, shallow waters into the deep offshore. I mean, you reflected, we just talked about shell announcement. We won't be surprised if you have other announcements coming uh, in the market as well, because the market is expecting that. So I believe that the local indigenous players uh, are poised uh, to take advantage of that to, to increase uh, their operations here in Nigeria, as well as attract some mid-sized IOCs into the country uh, as well. Well, I think what is important is that these assets are sold uh, to companies that uh, see themselves as stewards of the natural resources of the country. Uh, they have been in a position uh, to be able to continue to make the investment that is required you know, for the development of uh, the oil, as, oil and gas assets in the, in the, in the country. Uh, now you talk about relationship, you also have a good relationship with government. And back for the onshore assets, relationship with the, with the communities uh, for, for them to continue to operate, we believe probably you know, they could actually step up uh, development of these uh, assets. And uh, at the end of the day, let just be say, yes, I talked about it to be an opportunity for, for the government as well to enhance uh, production. Uh, we in uh, uh, Seplat, uh, we see ourselves right behind the IOCs in terms of uh, volume of production today also in terms of governance, operational efficiency, and, uh, and financial capacity. 
we believe that we're in a very good uh, position to to participate in uh, in this um, acquisition of this uh, divested uh, divested uh, as I said, we'll be looking at the opportunities to, to strengthen our upstream business and dominate, increase the dominance of the midstream, uh, the midstream oil and gas, uh, uh, gas business, uh, which we've seen that we're an active player in gas in this market and leading the energy transaction, the transition in terms of uh, gas production um, uh, locally. While we also uh, focused on renewables as the energy mix of the country, we believe, uh, keep changing over the next uh, 22, 22, 30 years. So I think it's a good, uh, we were excited. Uh, we're looking at the, uh, looking at very, with very keen interest on the opportunity that, that will come in that space in terms of uh, divestment. Thank you, Amika. That's, um, that's, uh, that's very clear. Um, let's talk now a bit um, about the energy transition in uh, in, in more detail. Uh, Mr. Seyesan, Nigeria is, clearly very independent on oil for its uh, prosperity. And um, and I believe that up until recently, there was this target of uh, about 4 million bars per day of um, of output, uh, which is about double, you know, the pre, pre kind of like uh, OPEC cut uh, levels. Uh, now, in light of the shifting energy trends and um, what is Nigeria's position on the energy transition and do you still maintain those production targets? So uh, indeed, um, Nigeria is totally committed to the energy transition agenda. And uh, we are also committed to net zero. Um, but I think we need to also situate um, regional needs and um, regional developments with the plans that uh, we all have. So as a nation, uh, we have committed to um, increasing our renewable footprint. And um, we, we, have, we have embarked on quite some projects uh, in the biofuel space, which we are still working on. Um, we are also um, tinkering with um, solar, but I think um, the, we, we are also going to be paying quite some attention to our uh, uh, carbon capture um, strategies. And um, on a go forward basis, um, we, we see gas as a major transition uh, fuel. Um, the Minister of State says um, he doesn't see it as a transition fuel, but as a destination fuel. Um, I, I, I agree with him to a large extent, you know, but we see gas, you know, we, we're endowed with the gas resources. And I believe that if we are able to um, utilize and um, reduce gas flaring, uh, in the process, we will also institute efficiencies, you know, um, in the uh, production uh, processes. So um, to, to, to uh, summarize, I, I, we, are, we are committed to the transition. Um, the program I earlier um, explained about where we are moving in the, in the gas uh, space, is an attest, attest, attestation to the fact that um, gas will be a major player here. But we are also committed to other renewable um, sources of energy. And uh, biofuels is, is a key alternative as well as um, working on our carbon um, storage strategies. Understand, but in general, when you look at uh, when I, when I, when people think of oil production, the idea is still to grow that production, to to you know continue and growing oil production, to to you know effectively monetize the reserves, the the humble reserves Nigeria has. Is that uh, is that how you be thinking of it? Yes, I think that goes without saying. We need to still produce because I mean the demand is there. The switch has not yet occurred. Do we have the wherewithal to switch? Not in the short term. In the long term, of course, we are working towards 2050. I believe we will get there, at least in the next 10 years, 
oil will still be relevant, but we will continue to ensure that we incorporate efficiencies into our utilization of our fossil funds. Understood, very clear. Uh, now let's talk a bit uh, briefly about um, West, uh, West Africa uh, more broadly. Now, Neil, Cosmos and Talo uh, are uh, responsible for many of uh, Africa's major discoveries. But uh, since the pandemic's outbreak, it looks like frontier exploration doesn't seem to be a priority anymore for, uh, for investors' dollars. So how do you see exp Africa's exploration outlook? Yeah, Nick, so yeah, I think in part partly relating to the last question, I think you know, to ensure sort of a just transition, we believe you know, the nations across Africa should be allowed to prosper from industries such as energy that uh, the developed world has depended on to drive its own prosperity. You know, for Cosmos, we want to work with countries in Africa to provide the world the energy you know, it needs today, um, but in the most you know, cost efficient and energy efficient uh, way. You know, Africa has a huge amount of discovered resource, you know, which has yet to be developed and monetized, uh, and that's you know, means of significant potential. Um, Cosmos is focusing its exploration expertise on working with partners in country you know, to produce the barrels that have already been found. Uh, as well as develop new resource around existing infrastructure that has the highest chance of being, you know, produced economically, uh, you know, over the next decade or so. And so, you know, we did step back from frontier exploration in early 2020, um, you know, due to the timelines involved uh, and the acceleration of the terminal value, which, you know, basically increases the risk uh, of generating a acceptable return for our investors. So I think that's a reality um, you know, that a lot of companies are, um, you know, having to deal with. Um, you know, there are a handful of uh, majors and, you know, independents uh, who will continue to pursue frontier exploration, um, but most have put a time limit uh, on how long they will continue to do that. So, you know, maybe for the next uh, two or three years. Um, but for Cosmos, given the exploration portfolio that we have, we, you know, we do see a lot of opportunity, particularly in West Africa, Equatorial Guinea, the Gulf of Mexico, within our portfolio to grow production around existing infrastructure where the cycle times are uh, shorter um, and new production can, uh, can be brought on sort of more economically and with less risk. Um, you know, it also has the benefit of you know, a lower carbon intensity given you know you're using existing infrastructure uh, rather than building sort of new greenfield uh, facilities and so you know for us that's the right strategy to continue to you know sort of grow uh, and explore um, you know for the next several years although people uh, will have different time frames to get there thanks but um but uh, but Cosmos is exit, and you know, I mean, uh, when when people think of Cosmos, they think of a company that is responsible for many of those discoveries. Uh, to me, it looks like um, you know, I mean, the if if in Africa, you know, you you are an established hydrocarbon province, then yeah, exploration will continue. But if you are that frontier, then in, in my, this might not be the case. Is is that is that how I should be thinking about this? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think th there's some companies, um, yeah, who will continue to selectively invest, you know, who've built portfolios in the past, who've matured prospects, invested in sort of the development of ideas, and, and will drill those prospects out of the next several years. And I think that you'll see sort of continue this year, next year, um, yeah, largely through maybe 24, 25. But I think, uh, you know, what you'll, what's becoming harder and harder is to access new acreage uh, frontier acreage and justify the risk reward of investment uh, because you know once you acquire the acreage you have to shoot seismic you've got to mature the opportunities before you can even drill it you know it was sort of a three three plus year time cycle to get to a drillable status uh, for you know to get to the right risk reward for frontier exploration and I think that's becoming um, a, a bit more challenging so you are seeing the activity sort of you know cluster around where there's been recent success um, and, you know, where the risk for um, success uh, is a lot better. Very clear, Neil. Thank you so much. Emeka, we, we're still on the same topic, energy transition. So um, it has already started putting some uh, pressure 
on the MP model, the, the energy transition. And uh, in your recent capital markets day, Seplat announced uh, its intention to enter solar and off-grid gas to power. Now, do you think that the EMP model can remain viable in, uh, in, the, in the next 20 or 30 years? Or was this announcement more like a hedge against a potential declining oil demand in the future? Okay, I believe that uh, the EMP model uh, will still remain uh, viable um, in the near future uh, with, a, with, the, with a complement of the right thinking and, uh, and planning. Okay, in Seplat, uh, we took a we took decision uh, years back uh, to make investment in gas uh, production and processing because we believe that gas is uh, gas will lead the energy transition here in Nigeria, particularly gas to, to power. Uh, supplying today, we're supplying about the 30% of uh, the gen code requirement for, uh, for gas. On our capital markets day, uh, we talked about our strategy uh, going forward. Um, we talked about the position of SEPLAT in terms of this transition and creation of our new energy uh, division. Uh, the division will continue to extend our presence in the in the gas business and uh, down the gas value chain. Uh, currently, we sell our gas over the fence. Directionally, uh, we would like uh, to go towards uh, gas to power. And uh, given the rigidities you have in the power industry in Nigeria today, we're taking a view that we should do uh, gas to power pipeline for off grid power, and that is our, that's the area of uh, the direction we want to intervene uh, in, uh, in, in the, power, the power sector. We are also monitoring the, the changes in energy mix, particularly for the, for the country. Uh, some of the studies we commissioned, one of them particularly, uh, came out with the report uh, that the solar, the solar industry here in Nigeria, in particular in terms of uh, supply, supply, uh, supply of power to homes and, uh, and commercial establishment, has a great, uh, great potential, talking about a growth of about 26% uh, CAGA for the next uh, 20 years, and the potential of about $17 billion um, here uh, in Nigeria alone. Uh, that report we are studying, and based on that report, we currently are looking at, are looking at extending uh, our presence in the, in the renewable park and in the solar, solar renewables. We also recognize that, that uh, we don't have um, uh, the in-house capacity currently for the kind of skill set required for that sector. Um, we believe uh, that could be a play of manufacturing or retail distribution. Uh, so part of what we are doing currently is enhancing capacity entirely to participate in that, uh, in that sector. We will, over the years, uh, be making uh, incremental uh, capital allocation to that sector to ensure that we lead not just in terms of gas transition, in terms of transition energy in Nigeria, in terms of gas, but also uh, participate in taking the opportunity in terms of uh, changing energy, energy mix here in Nigeria going forward. Very clear, Amika. Thank you so much for this. Neil, um, would you like to, to share your views, please, on, on the MP model, if it can remain resilient uh, based on the energy transition? Yeah, Nick. Uh, well, I mean, uh, the the EMP model is changing, um, and and I think you know companies have to respond to the energy transition. Um, companies are choosing to respond in, in in very different ways. You know, many companies are are choosing to you know reduce investment in EMP, uh, producing out their sort of reserve base, and then you know returning cash to shareholders. Um, you know, in the case of the majors, many are sort of uh, investing in green energies to sort of transition. Um, their uh, their portfolios. You know, this lack of investment in EMP, I think, you know, result will result in the best acreage being drilled first. Um, you know, within production declining. Um, you know, given sort of the minimal investment in new projects. Um, you know, we, we've taken a differentiated approach at Cosmos, where we're we're you know investing to grow, um, particularly in in Africa. Um, you know, where we see energy demand increasing as you know, the population increases and living standards uh, improve. And so, um, yeah, I think the model is, is being pressured and, and changed, but, you know, companies are handling it, um, it very differently. Um, you know, we're investing half our capital uh, is within the gas assets in Mauritania, Senegal. Um, yeah, as we talked about, you know, we think gas is going to play a very important role uh, in the energy transition as renewables ramp up um, and higher carbon emitting fuels such as coal uh, are phased out over time. Um, 
on oil, um, you know, we want to grow our lower cost, lower carbon oil portfolio investment uh, with focus on sort of the infrastructure led exploration. Um, and we want to work with governments to you know, accelerate economic and social progress uh, in developing countries and bring them uh, closer to the living standards that, that we're all accustomed to. Um, and so um, you know, th there will be uh, you know, significant sort of change within the EMP model. Uh, but I think um, you know, there's, you know, if, you know, if, if the whole um, you know, if there's a number of companies who are reducing their investment, there is room for those in the specific companies uh, and countries to grow their production in a responsible way. Thanks, Neil. That uh, was quite clear. Um, let's talk about um, a similar but related theme. That's uh, that's ESG. Um, Emeka, anybody who has been following Seplat's story closely will have noticed that. Um, your corporate communication uh, and general separate as a company has been uh, becoming a, a lot more like conscious on the energy transition and, and in general like ESG. And in, in a sector that is somewhat, you know, out of favor um, with some ESG investors, can you please talk briefly about, you know, what Seplat is doing to improve those um, ESG credentials? I, I think you already spoke a bit about, you know, renewables and uh, some of the gas, so I want to reiterate some of what you said already. Okay, thank you, Nick. Um, the, the major part of um, our GAG, uh, greenhouse emission coming from uh, gas, gas flares, it's about 90% of that. And uh, we're taking a decision, you know, based on uh, making investment in uh, gas flare projects. And by 2024, we're going to have a near gas, uh, gas flaring. And also for the, also the power, uh, talked about the, the upgrade in terms of using the gas for, for power, uh, power as, 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 as well. Now, uh, apart from that, um, internally as well, uh, not we believe that um, a major part of uh, the, the illicit crisis in the country is the fact that diesel generators are used to, to, uh, to generate most of the power they're using, they're, they're using in Nigeria. And we believe uh, our participation in the gas, uh, gas sector we replace the generators and reduce uh, the, the carbon footprint that are coming out of uh, uh, of this uh, diesel generator. And that's a very major component of our contribution to, to reduction in terms of uh, uh, emissions. We always also pride ourselves on the social side of the ESG uh, in terms of what we do with the communities. Um, we, we've had a very robust program of in community engagement uh, from health services to, um, uh, to education services. And uh, with the, the incremental uh, allocation, you know, coming out of the PIA as well, uh, that will strengthen, strengthen our, our position in terms of intervening in this, uh, in this uh, uh, sector, particularly on the social, social side, which we have done so well uh, today in Nigeria. Beyond that, in terms of governance, uh, we believe that uh, we have the best in terms of governance in the country in terms of uh, the quality of board and quality of uh, operation will continue to enhance that governance uh, uh, going forward. Um, that's, that's in a nutshell is what we're doing currently. And we'll also, we'll be enhancing the reporting that you see in our report in terms of what we're doing on, on the EAG space uh, generally. Right. Thank you, Mika. Neil, Cosmos uh, announced to us scope one and two net zero targets by 2030. That was long before any of your uh, African in PPS did and uh, have to compliment you on being, uh, I guess, ahead of the, the rest of the PS back then. Do you think that this will be uh, the gold standard for, for EMPs, uh, you know, going forward? And, uh, and you could maybe elaborate a bit more on how you plan on achieving that, uh, that target. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, you're right. You know, we, we did set a target for, you know, scope one and two uh, net zero by 2030 or sooner. Um, and we are sort of actively and have been actively for the last sort of year and a half um, in uh, pushing the agenda with our operators uh, and partners to improve you know, operational efficiency, reduce carbon emissions across the portfolio. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're also investing in carbon capture projects in the areas in which we work, um, working to offset any emissions that we can't um, mitigate. Um, you know, Scope one and two has been 
sort of uh, vocalized by, by lots of companies now over that last year and a half. Um, but I think you know, th there is growing interest from our stakeholders around you know, our scope three emissions. Um, and so um, you know, we've been working with uh, both inter internal and externally um, to get a, to better understand our scope three footprint. And we believe yeah, this ultimately will be a requirement um, for a lot of companies in the industry from multiple stakeholders. Um, and so I think um, we do want to ensure you know, we're being proactive on that front. Um, you know, at present, you know, there's still a lot of uncertainty around scope three um, and who's responsible for what, particularly for sort of EMP companies. You know, what part do producers, uh, you know, the midstream refineries, consumers, retail, sort of take part in that. And I think, um, you know, that will continue to be a discussion that plays out um, over several years. Um, but I think, you know, at Cosmos, you know, we, we, we want to continue to be proactive on the issue um, and work hard at, at it. I think, you know, firstly, by just understanding, um, you know, the, the current emission status, you know, what our scope three is, um, measuring it, um, and then working with others across the industry uh, to reduce uh, and mitigate those emissions. And I think, you know, we're in a fortunate position, um, you know, as we have our portfolio, you know, as we build gas, which has a lower, uh, lower emissions than oil, our scope three emissions naturally come down uh, over time as gas plays a larger piece within our portfolio. And so, um, yeah, and it's, it's hard to say that um, yeah, it's not, there's not sort of definitive gold standard, but I think the bar, you know, once you've achieved it, will continue to move higher um, as it should, uh, as we all sort of tackle um, the energy transition in a way that makes sense. Thank you so much for this, Neil. I mean, uh, what um, all, uh, all, all our panelists seem to be in consensus is that uh, gas is definitely, you know, required for the energy transition and um, and at least you know reducing a carbon footprint of countries. Now we only have a few minutes left, so as our discussion is is coming to an end, I'd like to give a few minutes to each of our panelists to share their views on on the outlook of West Africa, oil and gas sector, and uh, and and Nigeria as well. Um, Mrs. Sayesan, let's uh, start with you. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, indeed. Um, we started uh, discussing with uh, about the PIA. This is a long-awaited uh, milestone for us in Nigeria. Um, the look ahead, the look forward for us is exciting. Uh, we we think it's going to be a very very exciting time for the oil and gas industry. Um, we we are committed to um, developing our resources um, for the betterment of. Nigerians. Um, and this is also geared towards addressing um, the 17 SDG goals as well. We, we need to eradicate poverty and uh, we have a major resource. You know, we need to eradicate hunger. We have a major resource. We also need to address um, and provide affordable energy, you know, for for development as well. And we have a great resource. And I believe the PIA is a major enabler, you know, to us utilizing these resources, hydrocarbon resources that we have, you know, for the betterment of Nigerians. But having said that, we are also mindful that, yes, uh, the, the, the global decarbonization drive is, is a commitment that we've also made, and we will work and we are working to ensure that we uh, push that agenda even domestically. Um, like um, um, Emeka said, you know, even the mere conversion of uh, the um, energy source from diesel generators to gas uh, driven turbines uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a major shift, you know, in our um, carbon emission process, you know, and I know we have much more, you know, in the kitty in the years ahead. So we look, we look forward to an exciting time. The PIA is a major enabler for us and for NNPC, um, the, the whole transition to NMPC Limited, uh, we believe is going to be a seamless process. And 
we are committed to achieving the objectives for which the NMPC Limited is, uh, is to be set up on, and which is to be a commercial and profitable venture. We started on that tangent and our performance for 2020 was, like I said, a major testament to our resolve, our resolve to achieving you know, this objective. Um, we are also excited because we see a lot of appetites, you know, in the domestic space um, for um, resourceful companies wanting to play actively in the gas space as well. And that is very encouraging. We, we are discussing with our um, indigenous um, and um, indigenous partners and stakeholders on how we can expand um, and they can also participate in this space. So um, by and large, it's going to be an exciting time in the next couple of years. NMPC and its partners are all set to set this ball rolling. Thank you. Thank you so much for these um, insightful comments. Uh, Emeka, floor is yours. Yeah, I can't say better than Mr. Yassan has said. I think what an exciting time for the industry here in, in Nigeria. Uh, I think that there's a lot of focus on the PIA in terms of the physicals, but beyond the physical is that the whole architecture of the industry has changed in terms of governance, in terms of uh, regulation. You can imagine an excitement to welcome an NMPC that will be uh, driven uh, commercially uh, so that uh, they will be in a position to compete with other national oil companies. Or imagine an excitement to, to look at the prospect of independent funding of uh, development of assets in terms of the, the, the IJV to be formed with our partners. Uh, we're also excited because uh, the NAPC we see today will work very well with them and, and they have uh, so much focus on the success of the industry and so much commitment, uh, of course, which are reflected in getting the PI, the PI uh, passed after so many, uh, so many years. Now, uh, beyond the architecture of the industry, beyond the opportunity working with uh, the government uh, partner and welcoming uh, the NAPC into the, the commercial space, also the m and opportunities that have uh, thrown up, you know, the opportunity for indigenous companies to increase their footprint and participation in the industry. And with the energy transition and participation in gas, particularly where we're going to see an industry that will have to expand their internal leakages rather than being a standing link as previously like you've seen in terms of a crude oil and export of crude oil. So quite an exciting time. So I talked about uh, also new skill sets in terms of uh, chasing the, the energy mix in the country. If I'm going to participate in the renewables, you can see that you have to you know, develop skills there beyond participating in the extractive industry. So it's quite an exciting time. And we're very happy to to be well positioned to take advantage of opportunities that exist and are coming up in the, in the industry. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Emeka. Neil, are you as excited as, uh, as the other panelists about uh, Western Africa oil and gas outlook? In short, yes, uh, Nick. I think, um, yeah, I agree with a lot of, a lot of what um, yeah, the other panelists uh, said. Yeah, I think yeah, the outlook for sort of oil and gas in West Africa is, is bright. Um, you know, we are at an inflection point um, you know, within the industry where a lot of things are changing. And so the industry does need to be carefully managed, uh, particularly as we go through this sort of inflection point. Um, yeah, there's significant discovered resource in West Africa. Uh, and future potential um, that you know, we all need to be working together on. And so uh, you know, it requires governments and the right companies you know, working collaboratively to ensure you know, the resource is developed responsibly. Um, you know, I can say you know, Cosmos is doing our part uh, to grow production of low cost, low carbon oil and gas. Uh, and we think we can be a force for good, particularly in West Africa, as you know, the industry goes through that transition. Um, and so um, you know, while doing that, you know, we believe we, you know, we can create significant shareholder value as an independent company with a differentiated strategy uh, and asset base. And so, um, so yeah, no, I think the next few years will be particularly interesting. And and you know, Cosmos is excited to play its role within that uh, that space for West Africa. Thank you so much, uh, Neil, for those comments. I'd like to thank you all for your insightful comments today and uh, for your participation to our panel. Now our discussion panel has now concluded. So once again, thank you so much and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate it.
Knowledge is information. But not all information turns into knowledge. Today, every company leaves digital footprints in hundreds of different sources. But this information by itself does not tell you who it is you're looking at and what the risks of doing business with them are. Businesses can't exist in a vacuum. They need employees, customers, partners, contractors, investors. Good counter agents help a company succeed, create products, make profit, expand business opportunities. But what about bad ones? 49% of organizations around the world say that they've been victims of fraud or economic crime. Two-thirds of Russian companies say they've encountered economic crime in the past two years. This is significantly higher than the global average. Every year, 15% of companies simply disappear, whether on their own initiative or because they're forced to do so by tax bodies often leaving unpaid debts. If you want to minimize your risk, you need to find and analyze every scrap of information you can. Identifying, analyzing, collecting facts. Processing big data is impossible without qualified specialists, experience, time, expensive equipment, new technology, machine learning, graphs. Spark Interfacts gathers information from all available sources and converts it into knowledge, allowing you to see the world of business in its entirety with all its risks and opportunities. And there's no doubt that tomorrow we'll be able to understand the world of business even better thanks to the emerging digital economy, cutting-edge technology and the availability of new information about the lives of companies. Knowledge decreases risks and creates trust. The foundation of any successful business. Knowledge is information, but not all information turns into knowledge. Today, every company leaves digital footprints in hundreds of different sources. But this information by itself does not tell you who it is you're looking at and what the risks of doing business with them are. Businesses can't exist in a vacuum. They need employees, customers, partners, contractors, investors. Good counter-agents help a company succeed, create products, make profit, expand business opportunities. But what about bad ones? 49% of organizations around the world say that they've been victims of fraud or economic crime. Two-thirds of Russian companies say they've encountered economic crime in the past two years. This is significantly higher than the global average. Every year, 15% of companies simply disappear, whether on their own initiative 
or because they're forced to do so by tax bodies often leaving unpaid debts. If you want to minimize your risk, you need to find and analyze every scrap of information you can. Identifying, analyzing, collecting facts. Processing big data is impossible without qualified specialists, experience, time, expensive equipment, new technology, machine learning, graphs. Spark Interfacts gathers information from all available sources and converts it into knowledge, allowing you to see the world of business in its entirety with all its risks and opportunities. And there's no doubt that tomorrow we'll be able to understand the world of business even better thanks to the emerging digital economy, cutting-edge technology, and the availability of new information about the lives of companies. Knowledge decreases risks and creates trust. The foundation of any successful business.
Good. Thank you all for joining this um, fireside chat with the MTN Nigeria CEO, Carol Toriola, uh, as part of Renaissance Capital's 12th annual Pan-Africa Conference. MTN Nigeria remains one of the more dominant, actually the, the dominant telecoms provider in Nigeria with a number one position and a market share above 50%. Um, as of recent, it has a subscriber base that's quickly inching towards 80 million uh, and, and, a, and many vertical platforms underneath. Whether it be the Ayuba messaging app, which had 1.4 million users as of Q1 2021, or its Momo platform that currently has 4.7 million subscribers. MTN is one of the strongest revenue generators in the Nigeria space across all corporates. And as of recently, uh, is the official sponsor of, of the Nigeria Football uh, Association. Um, we thank Carl for joining us at this meeting. And what we'll try and do here is dissect and dimension MTN, where it is now, and, and what the outlook for the future is. Whilst also uh, talking through uh, the, vi the vision as well as the views uh, that uh, Carl has gone through as he transversed various management positions across the MTN group. Um, so I'll start with my first question, uh, and, and that would be, uh, Carl, you've held various uh, management positions within the MTN group in different markets for over 15 years. What is common across African telecoms and what differentiates these various markets? Hi, Sam. Um, always nice to be with Renaissance Capital. You guys are friends of the house. And um, we see regularly. So it's a real pleasure to be part of, of, of your Pan-African Investor Conference. And thanks for the question. As you said, I've been with MTN Group plus minus 15 years and um, worked particularly a lot in, in West Africa. Um, but at some point in time, responsibility for opcos in the Middle East and rest of Africa, Zambia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's been a privilege and a blessing to get such a diversity of experience across the MTN group and has helped me in each step of my career. Um, so what are the similarities? Look, in Africa, I think there's a theme of the youth, um, the youth wanting to be um, entrepreneurial, a strong entrepreneurial spirit amongst the youth, an expression of unique identity amongst the youth. I think that's one of the themes that you see generically across. Every country, every operation says we're special, we're extra challenging, but the truth is um, to some extent, the, 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 there's a lot of similarities in all the countries in terms of the challenge. Um, dependent on the litigation, regulation, and taxation systems and the sets of laws that are in each country, there are some variants. Um, some places um, have unique challenges, um, You'll see some places you have a 19% tax VAT rate in Nigeria. It's a 7.5% VAT rate. Um, some countries and operating environments um, have different ways of encouraging investments into the country. And some are more technologically advanced and more liberal in terms of um, how private operators allow to, 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 to develop uh, infrastructure like fiber, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I, I focus more on the theme of commonality. We have a wide variety of cultures, but I think the identity of Africans in some ways are very similar. Um, Africans, I am African, um, very warm people, um, very expressive. So you might mistake in our expressiveness and our passion and screaming and shouting for aggression, but actually it's quite the con contrary, um, very warm, loving people. And I enjoy working across Africa and miss some of the countries that I used to work in before. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's great to hear. And I think this issue of commonality or, or, or this version of commonality is what binds us and what makes MTN not just as specific market, in specific markets, but as a group, a, a, a wholesome uh, name and, and why investors focus, focus on it. I think if we were to drive down further into the current market in which you run, uh, how would you characterize the Nigerian market in 2021? And we look at that from a perspective of competition the regulatory environment, as well as technological advancement. So look, let, let me just maybe also address some of the harder questions from an investor perspective um, that from the previous question. Look, we have high um, youth, a large percentage of the population are youth. Uh, there's huge opportunities, both in terms of data consumption, um, in terms of small, medium enterprises, and in terms of financial inclusion. So that's pretty much the generic um, across. Sure. African countries, Nigeria inclusive. 
um, but maybe a wider runway in, in some countries than the other. In terms of how I'd characterize um, MTN Nigeria and Nigeria as a whole, um, it's very competitive. Look, we are number one. I don't like the use of the word dominant. I disagree, um, but we're number one in terms of market size um, by quite a gap. But it's a very, very uh, uh, intensive environment in terms of the competitive environment. Um, the number two, I won't mention their name, are a good, strong professional organization. Um, so it's by no means uh, a free ride for MTN. And there's an, in, an intensification of, of competitiveness in a few spaces. Um, in the last eight months or so, we've been quite aggressive. We've put our foot down to the, on the pedal and in terms of our, our capex investments um, with a lot of focus on LT expansion. Mm -hmm. um, and we've now reached somewhere in the range of 65% of LT coverage of the population. But that says we still have another 35% to go um, to cover, to cover uh, the country in terms of high-speed mobile broadband. Um, we continue to compete very effectively. We're focused on competitiveness, not just in terms of technology leadership, data, data speeds, quality, um, but in terms of pricing within the regulations um, that we're allowed to, to follow. Um, so it is our position that we must always remain competitive. We don't want to race to the bottom in terms of pricing, um, but we must always be perceived as being very competitive when you look at the mix of, of the services we offer, the quality of the service we offer vis-a-vis um, -vis our prices. Um, the demand for digital services remains extremely strong. Um, so we're accelerating the rollout of both capacity and coverage um, of our data network. Um, and this is driven by, by lifestyle changes that come from the adoption of data um, people consuming a lot more data um, both for uh, personal entertainment reasons so the likes of netflix youtube youtube's all the otts whatsapp video calls etc is driving this but um, as well as um, looking for increased efficiency and productivity across all spaces of the economy so um, we as a standalone um, are an integral part of the economic growth in Nigeria um, in the past 20 years. But we are also we have also been a major catalyst, um, banking applications, e-commerce, um, advertising, um, using all the OTCs, et cetera, have been enabled by the platform that we put in place. Um, you mentioned 80 million subscribers. Actually, we're more around 70 million. The ban of um, new SIM registrations up until somewhere around May did affect all the operators in the country. Uh, through that period, we believe we gained a bit of market share marginally. You'll see that in our, in our half year results. Mm -hmm. um, and now we've returned with the, the associate NIN registration to SIM, um, to re registering new subscribers. Um, we're pretty much bottomed out in terms of the loss of subscribers. People who had lost their SIM cards, had churned, um, could not register because there was a ban. Now they can enroll for a NIN, National Identification Number. We have a license to do that. We're doing that for and on behalf of the government and also get a SIM card um, consequently. Um, so this impacted us. Um, we resumed the sale of SIM cards somewhere late April, early May, um, and we're scaling up. We're still not at our peaks of our capacity um, to register SIM cards, but we're scaling up and we expect um, the, the, the churn and the bottom out of the base effect to flush out in the next uh, few months and start to rebuild our customer base. But as I've always said consistently, people saw the NIN registration and the SIM sales ban as a challenge, but I actually saw it as an opportunity um, for to do two things. One is to support the federal government in its drive to register uh, um, um, the, the citizens of the country. But you see, if you issue a SIM card with a national identity number, which has been duly issued by the National Identity Management Commission, sure. um, then you have zero risk of fines um, around SIM registration. So for us, it was an opportunity as well. And also, um, churn is very costly. The washing machine effect of people chasing promotions all over the place, actually, you spend a lot of money just basically pouring SIM cards down the drain. Um, so having a much cleaner base um, of subscribers who really want your services are less likely to churn is actually an upside for the industry. So um, seen as a challenge, um, but but um, it's been it's I think it's been an upside. Um, but to recap, competitive market, we are focused on being competitive in terms of pricing, not a race to the bottom, but to remain competitive. Um, huge growth on data driven by COVID, Zoom, things like this. Um, Microsoft Teams and all those nice applications. 
personal data consumption, an increased number of people coming into the data world, so accelerating the number of active data subscribers. Um, and we continue to play in the fintech space um, um, through our PSP, sorry, not our PSP, let me make that very clear, our super agent license yes. uh, 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 um, um, to develop a, a distribution network for, for, for financial services in the country, as well as a few other products. And so we're optimistic about the future. Well, no, that's good to hear. And I, actually, as you speak, I, I see that if at all you have a NIN with a phone number that's MTN, when you move through the verticals, what you do have is a fully KYC client uh, that can be ut utilized quite quickly and, and, and uploaded onto that stream. And you've talked about LTE and the fact that you now cover 65% of the population. And I, I think the next step as you look through global telecoms is, is, is the move to 5G. When do you see MTN Nigeria starting to roll out of a commercial 5G network in the country? And do you think this will make a big change in the daily lives of, of consumers and the population at, at large? So we're very much um, operating under the guidance of the regulators. Um, the Honorable Minister of Communications and the Digital Economy has, called, has, has expressed, and we have supported in full um, his broadband plan for the country. And he has expressed in his intention for 5G services to be licensed as well as an auction for the spectrum around the 3,500 megahertz band um, imminently. Um, the stakeholder um, engagement process um, has been um, um, gone through by the ministry um, and the, the regulator. Um, and we believe that the information memorandum for the auction of the spectrum, which we're interested in, and the authorization to launch at the auction and the authorization to launch 5G is relatively imminent. So the policy document, um, according to the Honorable Minister, is ready. The next step is the information memorandum. And then we'll be invited to hopefully participate, to participate in an auction for the spectrum and subsequently launch will happen. When will the auction happen? It's not within our control. I must reiterate that and be clear um, that that is firmly a regulatory process. But we've been, the regulator has been very supportive um, of this process. So we think probably the investment memorandum will be out October. Uh, maybe an auction will happen somewhere between November, December, maybe January, and probably in the range of February. So we might, again, I cannot speak for, for, for government authorities, but we might be able to launch 5G. And we want to do it on a, on a, on a would I say, a, a decent scale. Um, there are limited handsets of 5G handsets um, in the country. So you can't invest on nationwide coverage and, and generate no incremental revenue for incremental capital which we put on, on the ground. Our capital allocation uh, priorities and process will make sure that whatever we invest can actually lead to, 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 to an acceleration of our top line. Um, but so when it is finalized from a regulatory point of view, we'll go in and we'll go in smartly, um, but as heavily as we reasonably can. So we maintain our leadership position, both in technology and in perception in mind of the customers. Where is the immediate business opportunity? Probably in the earlier days, it's in fixed wireless access um, for both corporates and residential consumption. Mm -hmm. um, but there are quite a number of other use cases around the world, which will eventually come to Nigeria. Um, but certainly having those kind of data speeds on a wireless basis enables a lot of people to come um, quicker into the data space to increase their productivity and get all sorts of brilliant connectivity solutions. Thank you. Thank you. And I think the other point we touched out at the very start of this was around fintech. Uh, fintech is very important to the MTN group and particularly Nigeria, given the population, given the advancements and given the wholehearted um, exploration, but also um, um, uptake by, by many parts of the population. MTN Nigeria currently has 4.7 million Momo users, so mobile money users, users 450,000 agents as of Q1. Uh, and the ambition is, is to have that to become 40 million users by 2025. This target could be seen as ambitious, I think is within the realm of reality. And it'd be interesting to understand your thoughts about the necessary steps to, to achieve that. 
So, I mean, the current <clears throat> licensing regime that we have offers us, we hold a, a, a super agent license. So we don't hold um, customer wallets um, under the current regime. Mm -hmm. The primary focus while we continue to, to develop our agent network and use that for a variety of transactions, um, our primary thrust of our strategy around FinTech to really get a uh, scale um, in the business is the acquisition of a PSP license. We have not been that successful um, with that in, 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 in earlier years, but we believe that as part of my top priorities um, to fix some of the basic problems around stakeholder management in Nigeria, we've been investing a lot um, in stakeholder relationship building in Nigeria. And part of that is, of course, relationship building with all arms of the government, including the Central Bank of Nigeria. Some of those programs which we've gone through is our road infrastructure tax credit scheme, where we actually build a road, but we actually get uh, most of those, pretty much all of those funds back from in terms of tax credits. Um, but it helps uh, the Nigerian government with acceleration of infrastructure rollout. So we're committed to a new Bonita, um, expressway refurbishment. That's probably the most important road in the east of the country. Um, I think we've done that in a very positive and constructive manner with two ministries, the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry um, of Works. And that's, so that's one example. We've recently committed to sponsoring the Nigerian Football Federation. Football is in the hearts of all Nigerians and all Africans, uh, as you all know. Um, we have committed to demonstrate our further commitment to a long-term future in Nigeria. We've committed to the construction of a, of a state-of-the-art green head office here. And that program is probably going to take four years, uh, maybe even more. The message we're sending, and this is all going to come back, connect back to FinTech. The message we're sending is we're Nigerian. We're here to stay. We want to be an integral part of this community. We want to support um, the advancement of Nigeria. And it's a direct, but also a sublime message, which really should start to stabilize some of the stakeholder and government relationships that we've had challenges with, with in the past, and enable us to unlock some of the opportunities such as FinTech. Now, I have said this consistently, the decision on whether or not to give us a PSP is 100% firmly in the hands of the Central Bank of Nigeria. And we can't blackmail, uh, wish it will happen. They have to be optimistic and positive about our contribution to this country and financial inclusion to open uh, 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 some of those uh, blockages that we've had in the past. But we've been engaging repeatedly and really talking about how we can contribute towards financial inclusion. And we think in due time, I can't predict when, but in due time, we might be able to unlock this opportunity. So the 40 million is based on a PSP license, which allows us to hold and develop wallets in the country, specifically focused on people who are not financially included. So it's more of the bottom of the pyramid and rather than threaten the traditional banking industry, it actually accelerates it. And we have lots of countries where we've seen that happen. And effectively, our assumption is over a few years, three, four years, we'd have 50% of our base actively transacting on mobile money. And that's where you see that 40 million subscriber come, uh, come to pay. Um, so watch this space. Um, we'll continue our efforts in stakeholder relationship building. But in parallel, there are other verticals within the FinTech space, part of which is the super agent uh, license, which we have building a net distribution network within the fintech space, there's B2B businesses, which we continue to explore to ensure that we are not just blindly stuck on one strategic path, but looking at multiple routes to, to really get into the fintech uh, uh, vertical. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, and, and there are two questions that pop up from there. And the first one perhaps is a bit more around the view of, 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 of mobile money. And we've seen certain entities spin off mobile money uh, from their from their telecoms business, there is a point of view that Momo, the Momo business is deep, deeply integrated in, in telco operations, thus cannot be standalone. But there's also the alternative view that uh, perhaps standing alone, like with, with many things, uh, enables it run quicker and, and be more successful. What is the main idea from your perspective on the separation of Momo, and do you think that's something that uh, that would work for the Nigeria market and perhaps even uh, across across the MTN group. So, one of the reasons that 
telcos have been the most successful in terms of financial inclusion, particularly at the bottom of the pyramid, is two things. One, customer relationships and information. Um, two, um, a very strong distribution network for airtime, which is leveraged up. Um, the almost always the largest distribution network networks in the country. And three is the ability to invest on a sustained long-term scale Mm -hmm. um, educating and registering people for mobile money uh, services um, up until the point where it becomes intuitive um, and widely accepted. And mm -hmm. that is why mobile operators have consistently been the ones to really accelerate this. Um, does it need to be standalone? Does it need to be integrated? I think having a mobile network operator in terms of having a partnership where you can leverage of those uh, uh, strengths is critical to the success um, on one hand. On the second hand, on the other hand, um, the transparency of the value of a fintech business and the multiples of valuation of a fintech business are such that sometimes when you bury them under the core business of a telco, people like yourselves actually don't see the value that's created. And on the third um, aspect I want to talk about is regardless at some point in time to ensure that everyone has a playing field, the relationships between um, the mobile money businesses, be they integrated and um, the telco, uh, be they integrated or separate, have to be done on a fair value um, arm's length basis. Yeah. So um, there's multiple reasons to separate. One of them is the transparency of the valuation of the businesses. The second is to ensure that you have proper governance and there are different governance requirements um, if you're working in a financial industry, financial services uh, uh, business from a telco business. So you want to ensure that you have the right board of directors you have the right managers with the requisite uh, uh, prudential skills, um, uh, um, risk management skills, anti-money laundering, all of those things. So that gives another reason to separate it, to create a different set of competencies which may be a bit lost um, within a telco business. Um, and to also open it, the space up for various types of partnerships uh, uh, um, uh, um, and potentially investors um, who can come into this business and work with us to really accelerate the overall uh, expansion of the space. Thank you. And then you mentioned partnerships there. And, and as you look through partnerships, yes, we mentioned earlier on this call that um, there's been intense competition, whether it be from telcos itself, whether it be from the banks, and, and also uh, from independent fintechs who seem to be raising large amounts of money uh, from most, mostly from external sources, but also from internal sources as we move forward. How do you expect that landscape to evolve from that perspective? Is it one of multiple partnerships? Is it one of MTN essentially becoming an API play? Because you do have this 70 million plus investors that are essentially KYC. And, and, and I, you are able to leverage off, off, off that. Yeah, look, it's going to be an intense space, but there are many different sectors and segments of that space. But, and I think where our opportunity lies is really on the unbanked. A lot of the fintech solutions that are garnishing so, so, such big valuations, while they have helped and accelerated uh, uh, um, uh, um, financial inclusion, still remain focused on the well-educated, uh, financially savvy, already transacting, already banked customers. Mm -hmm. The opportunity where you really need the telco for financial inclusion is really at the bottom of the pyramid. And for the reason which I enumerated on earlier on, uh, the scale of investment you need to, to, do, to get uh, that kind of ecosystem up to scale, Distribution in remote villages in Damaturu and Oguachuku and uh, uh, Tonkere in, in Oshun State. Those kind of skills are not things that are covered by um, what we see now as the booming fintech industry. So the, I think there's still a huge opportunity, particularly um, for, for, for mobile operators. I think the depository money banks um, haven't been able to tap into that opportunity. I think the new fintechs are tapping into a lot of transaction velocity, um, but those are really for the already banked. Um, and it's going to change. Look, I can give you a set of predictions, and in six months, they're completely irrelevant. Um, but part of what we're also doing in empty end is to build a culture of agility that allows us to adapt. But that space of the real unbanked still remains 
uh, a bit of a blue ocean um, where we can really get going and really assist and support the country with, with financial inclusion. Does that answer the question you were asking? Um, yes, yes, it does. Yes, it does. And, and whilst we're on that, uh, one thing I wanted to go before talking around your, uh, your, your being at the forefront of tower infrastructure is just to understand the plans for Ayuba. Uh, that's been widely successful since, since its launch. Uh, and, and I wanted to understand your vision uh, for that in Nigeria. Um, look, the biggest valuation creation um, in a lot of the capital markets um, and in the technology world has been around platform businesses. Um, and Ayoba has started as a communications app, but over time will grow to be an app that serves a lot more and integrates a lot of the other things that we do in MTN. So it's a communications app um, to evolve into a customer services and self-service app purchasing app, at some point in time, we'll have potentially layers of, of M-commerce on there and integrate it into our whole fintech world. So we started off leveraging what our um, strength is, which is uh, connecting people and using that as an app, um, which you can use to respond to the various entities and start to build some skill and a lot of interaction interfaces with customers. Um, but over time, it's going to evolve into to a lot more than that. Um, you understand? Yes, understood. Clear. Um, sometimes I answer the question. I'm not quite sure if I hit uh, the response uh, uh, of respond responded to the specific question that you asked. No, you've answered it in a holistic way, uh, which captures or what is required in there. And, and then we we'll move on to tower infrastructure. MTN Nigeria has always has been at the forefront of, of tower infrastructure across outsourcing across Africa and in Nigeria. Um, Many of the independent tower companies have done transactions with yourselves. And Nigeria is not just a benchmark for African telcos, but it's also proof there's the efficiency in that independent tower co model. What were the reasons for this? And how do you see this, that part of the business advancing uh, moving forward? So there were multiple reasons. The, and I'm not sure in which order you can take the priority, but first is our core business was going to evolve. Um, and we needed to focus on the service layer associated with telecommunications rather than the infrastructure, real estate, power part of it. Um, it was taking up a huge amount of resources, both human and financial, to manage um, everything associated with owning towers across Nigeria. Um, so it was a better business model. And over a long term basis, you see clearly that your network performance in terms of availability improves when you outsource this to a company like ATC, IHS, whoever it may be, that all they do is focus on that all day. So that's one reason. And we've seen the result of that. Our uptime is a lot better than it was when we used to self-manage these assets. The second thing is, it's a real estate asset. Um, and the more occupancy you have, it's like having a hotel. Um, and if you have 50% occupancy, there's a minimum cost which you're going to pay. And if you have 100% occupancy, you're going to uh, cream off the the upside. And so it was a way of us um, being able to move an asset which was serving only us into a structure where it could be monetized to multiple operators a lot more effectively because MTN, that not being its core business, was not very good at adding um, additional tenants onto our towers and taking oh. advantage of the real estate assets portfolio that we had built up. Um, so that was another reason. And then depending on country by country, the structure, there was also a good uh, capture of value or realization of value in, in the sale of some of those assets where there was a large cash transaction. If you look at Nigeria and the currency devaluation, doing it at the time that we did in hindsight was actually a very good thing uh, for us. There was, there was quite a considerable amount of value that was created um, through that. Um, and yeah, so that, those are the reasons why we've driven in that direction. We will always continue to optimize our business model. So if there are things that we see that are not core to the services that we're providing today or we'll be providing in five years time, um, if there's ways we can do two things, one, move those kind of activities or assets to partners who can do it better than us, while capturing some of the up upsides that might come from what I use as an example, multiple tenancies, et cetera, and it could be the same for fiber, it could be the same for, for, for telcos. We will explore those. I'm not saying we're committed to any specific line, but we'll continue to look at that and evolve our business 
uh, models as, as it goes along. Thank you. And, and I, I think we, we have captured many of the key parts around the MTN business, whether it's uh, growth, outlook, regulatory, competitive landscape. And I wanted to find out whether there were any parts uh, that investors should be looking at uh, as, they, as, as they invest in MTN's equity, or as they look through MTN's various debt transactions. What should the focus be? What, what can they hold you to uh, as they look forward, uh, look forward to MTN's performance in the next six to 12 months? Look, six to 12 months is, is quite a short time to hold um, any leadership team to. But I will talk broadly about what our priorities are. Um, if you look back at MTN Group and MTN Nigeria, we've suffered extensively from significant shocks to the system as a result of regulatory challenges. Um, some of those were partial own goals. Some we were, we could, people could perceive we were treated a little bit harshly. And a lot of those were because we were not extremely effective at stakeholder relationship management. And so I, when I resumed on this job, I had a few priorities. One um, was stakeholder relationship rebuilding. So I've spent probably an inordinate amount of time on external stakeholders, on communicating to the stakeholder environment, to the press, um, to government officials, to rebuild those relationships and reposition MTN as a humble company, uh, one that is really willing to invest on a long-term basis to the, in the advancement of Nigeria, um, um, and a Nigerian identity. And I've done that for six months. There's a theme that's going to continue. My face might not be as much in front of it. Um, I'd rather pull back a little and let some of my other executives lead that story. And we have to execute on the projects where I spoke about the RITC, uh, um, the, 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 the head office. And there's a lot more. I'm just talking about the big headline ones. And I think we've seen some dividends in terms of a stable operating environment, minimal shocks, that's one. The resilience of our balance sheet, um, the nature of our debt profile, you would have heard about our upgrade um, um, on, on, on our ratings. Um, that leads us to, 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 to borrow um, at a lower cost. And particularly as interest rates and inflation starts to rise in Nigeria, we have a fixed long-term view um, on, on, on our cost of debt. Um, which we're continuing to explore further um, and ways we can really fix the cost of debt and be slightly resilient to, to the, the interest rates going up. So that's the structure of the balance sheet, the structure of our debt, et cetera. Stakeholder management, uh, a, a, a risk rating uh, a, um, debt structure. Then there's a return to competitiveness, to leadership, not just in absolute numbers, but leadership in the market. And that is reflected by our acceleration of our 4 g rollout. Um, it's gone from 60%, uh, probably sub 60 to 65% in the first six months of the year. We'll continue to do that in an aggressive manner. And while keeping a very close eye on our Forex US dollar debt profile, we will be quite aggressive in the CapEx framework as we can reasonably while keeping our commitments on dividends and so on and so forth. So there's a return to competitiveness, um, which we've done really well. I mean, it doesn't put it down, but I think there's a lot more that we can unlock by, by really accelerating uh, uh, things like LTE rollout, et cetera, et cetera. I'm very much focused on the culture of the organization um, and really having an agility um, in the organization in place to cater for the rapid change of the environment in which we operate in. Things are going to change all the time, and we must have the agility to, to, to transform rapidly. We must have true leadership, not just of skill, um, but in terms of our mindset, um, our ability to respond to the market, um, how we are perceived in the hearts and minds of customers. So that's the critical aspect. So cultural transformation of MTN Nigeria is probably what I obsess about the most now, especially since we've sort of gotten the the, the oil tanker moving on stakeholder relationships. I obsess about that incredibly much because the strategies, I mean, you guys are all very well-educated people, but your strategy evolves so fast. The most important thing is to have the agility and the culture to be able to adapt yourself. Then there's a big focus on efficiency as well. 
Um, at the scale that we operate in, um, we must have the upside of efficiency on our side. There are some structural issues which um, are not that easy to change, um, but I see that as a challenge, not a problem. And there are other ways where we can find um, uh, um, efficiencies within the organization. And then new vertical spaces, um, new or accelerating existing verticals, FinTech, home broadband, digital, which includes the whole IOVA space as well, um, our opportunities and, and, and um, white spaces or blue ocean spaces where, where we can really get into on a large scale. So um, we see the business is continuing to do well, six to 12 months to assess um, how well we've changed is probably a little too short. I think 24 months after my resumption, I think you can take a snapshot and see what it takes because a lot of the numbers will still be within the noise, within accelerated investment, et cetera. But in 24 months, I think you'll see the results. The best way I can express what you what you, you said is I personally leveraged myself to buy shares in MTN Nigeria. Um, I wouldn't do this and pay interest, which is not cheap in Nigeria, if I didn't believe there was a significant upside um, to this business. Um, and so take that as you may, um, but that's my personal belief and I put my money where my mouth is. That's good to hear. And I think the share price performance over the last 12 months have essentially proven this. And, and I think the market is reading it as, as a new step and all, all, all of the initiatives you've mentioned are, are clearly being taken uh, as, as being positive. So I, I think on that note, thank you very much for your time. It's ladies and gentlemen, you've heard uh, the strategy around MTN Nigeria uh, and, and, and the path for growth as, as we move forward. Thank you once again for joining and we look forward to engaging soon. Thank you, Sam, and everyone else who organized this and to all the people who joined. Thank you very much. is information, but not all information turns into knowledge. Today, every company leaves digital footprints in hundreds of different sources. But this information by itself does not tell you who it is you're looking at and what the risks of doing business with them are. Businesses can't exist in a vacuum. They need employees, customers, partners, contractors, investors. Good counter agents help a company succeed create products, make profit, expand business opportunities. But what about bad ones? 49% of organizations around the world say that they've been victims of fraud or economic crime. Two thirds of Russian companies say they've encountered economic crime in the past two years. This is significantly higher than the global average. Every year, 15% of companies simply disappear, whether on their own initiative or because they're forced to do so by tax bodies often leaving unpaid debts. 
If you want to minimize your risk, you need to find and analyze every scrap of information you can. Identifying, analyzing, collecting facts. Processing big data is impossible without qualified specialists, experience, time, expensive equipment, new technology, machine learning, graphs. Spark Interfax gathers information from all available sources and converts it into knowledge, allowing you to see the world of business in its entirety with all its risks and opportunities. And there's no doubt that tomorrow we'll be able to understand the world of business even better thanks to the emerging digital economy, cutting-edge technology and the availability of new information about the lives of companies. Knowledge decreases risks and creates trust the foundation of any successful business.